and they said that they had found the lady's vehicle on a dead end street and that they were making a house to house search for her. And as soon as they said house to house search, it was as if I heard someone speaking to me, said she's not in a house. And as soon as that thought registered, I saw exactly where she was. It was like there was a picture in front of me. On December 15, 1980, 31-year-old Melanie Uribe was leaving her house for her shift at the Pacoima Hospital in California in her pickup truck. What was supposed to be a normal and unassuming workday took a dark turn when a witness saw two men abducting the nurse by forcing themselves into her pickup truck at the stoplight. That was the last time she was seen alive. Who were these two men? Who would want to kill Melanie? Pacoima comes from the Tenavium language, meaning entrance. Pacoima, California, a town rooted in history and natural wonders. Named after a small stream, it was settled by farmers with a Mayan origin around 1500. The Two Brothers Rock Formation, a Southern California landmark, shaped by an underground river, adds unique charm. Founded by two brothers, Pacoima thrived economically through their healing practices. Today, it boasts one of the nation's cleanest water supplies, sourced from natural springs. The population of this town is around 77,000 in 2020, and petty crimes like property theft and robberies are pretty common, but hardly any cases of assault or murder. This was where our victim was based. Melanie Uribe was born September 9, 1948. Melanie was 31 years old in 1980 when the incident occurred and worked in Pacoima Hospital in Burbank, California as a nurse. She married quite young, but the marriage soon ended in a divorce and she was left to be a single mother to her 8-year-old son. She was loved and adored by people around her. Her friends and co-workers did describe her as a hard worker, always ready to lend a helping hand. She was dedicated to provide her son a comfortable life and was a diligent worker. She hardly missed any of her shifts at work, which is why it was alarming when she didn't show up for her shift on December 15, 1980. Her employer tried contacting her, but got nothing from her friends or family. No one knew where she was. On December 15, 1980, Melanie was on her way to her shift at the Pacoima Hospital as she usually did. However, that night, she never arrived at her destination. As someone who was known for her diligence, her absence during her shift caused great concern, prompting her employer to telephone her house, but they got no answer. No one had heard from Melanie. It was if she had vanished from the face of the earth. Fearing for the worst, the LAPD were informed of her sudden disappearance. A hunt for Melanie was underway, but without any direction or information to go off, the search for Melanie was nothing more than a wild goose chase. As the search proceeded, the police were only able to find Melanie's truck the following morning. What was perplexing was the fact that the truck was burnt. However, there was no sign of an accident, nor was there a body in sight. It was not until an unnamed witness came forward, recalling to see two men force themselves into Melanie's truck while she had stopped at a stoplight on her way to work. And one of them jumped her on the, car, on the driver's side, and the other one comes running around on the other side, and she was screaming. With this, what was considered a case of a missing person solidified into a case of abduction. However, her disappearance was quickly overshadowed by another woman. On December 17, 1980, an aerospace company employee, Etta Smith, was having a usual day at work when she heard about Melanie's case on the radio, which led to a rather strange string of events. Unaware of the case of Melanie before this broadcast, she heard that Melanie was missing and detectives were searching for her. Having a sudden vision of Melanie, she claimed that Melanie was not in any house. And they said that they had found the lady's vehicle on a dead-end street and that they were making a house-to-house -house search for her. 
And as soon as they said house to house search, it was as if I heard someone speaking to me said she's not in a house. And as soon as that thought registered, I saw exactly where she was. It was like there was a picture in front of me. She was so sure and surprised about it herself, as this was the first time Etta had a psychic vision. Upon entertaining that thought, she asserted that she experienced a vision resembling a very clear movie in her mind. The imagery included a canyon, a winding road, shrubbery, hills in the background, and a dirt path leading to something white. I have to tell you, this missing lady, I could see where she was. Can you show me this on a map? And I said, sure. Etta predicted the white to be the nurse's uniform that Melanie must have worn while leaving for work. Detective Lee Ryan was handling the case. Etta reached out to him, initially skeptical of his respect for her credentials as a businesswoman. Etta located the area where she believed Melanie's body would be found on a map, a remote part of the San Fernando Valley, Lopez Canyon, above Lakeview Terrace. Etta had a strong vision that Melanie would be found in that area. She wasn't sure if she'd be alive or dead. After informing the police of her vision, Etta was surprised to meet the detectives the following day to look for the areas in her vision via helicopter. However, she did not wait for the police and left to look for Melanie with a few family members. Gently ascending the canyon in her car, she experienced a distinct sensation, a kind of emotional upheaval, signifying Melanie's presence. This conviction solidified in her mind, compelling her to navigate the canyon once more. Observing recent tire marks, the same inner turmoil resurfaced, and she intuited a connection between this vehicle and the unfolding events. Progressing deeper into the canyon above Lakeview Terrace, they halted again when Etta's daughter spotted something unusual in the foliage. Etta, drawn towards it, encountered a figure clad in white nurse's shoes, mirroring the landscape from her earlier visions. The autopsy conclusively identified the body as that of Melanie Uribe, revealing a grim narrative of robbery, stripping, assault, and fatal assault. Etta's earlier vision, as she had recounted it, aligned with the forensic findings. Despite this confirmation, the perpetrators behind Melanie's tragic fate remained elusive. Regrettably, suspicion began to center on Etta in the wake of these developments. Inescapably, on the evening following the discovery of Melanie's body, Etta found herself under arrest. Detectives genuinely suspicious of how she possessed foreknowledge of the case subjected Etta to extensive questioning. I don't think they're believing me. I kept telling them the same thing. After hours of interrogation, they administered a polygraph test. Despite successfully passing the test, the detectives informed her that she had failed. They said, you failed. With one detective providing sworn testimony alleging deceptive behavior, including an attempt to control her breathing. Law enforcement entertained the notion that if Etta wasn't directly implicated in the crime, her information might have originated from neighborhood gossip or someone privy to details, but unwilling to step forward. They speculated that her purported vision might have been driven by a desire for financial gain. While a more charitable interpretation could attribute her polygraph failure to the psychological impact of the traumatic vision and the subsequent search for the corpse, it still left her in the perplexing position of possessing detailed knowledge about the body's location with an improbable source. Consequently, the following morning saw her officially charged with murder. She was arrested on December 18, 1980, and was kept barefoot in a cell. She was given nothing to eat or drink for 24 hours, and police hoped she would break and confess her crime. Etta was kept in holding for a total of four days. Not a letter, not a phone call, 
nothing. They treated me like so much dirt that you kick out the door and the wind blows away. It was during these days that a witness came forward to the LAPD and confessed that he heard 21-year-old Louis Carnell Morgan, 21-year-old Spencer Nelson, and an unnamed 17-year-old man whose identity has been hidden due to his age, bragging about killing Melanie. They were arrested soon after and confessed to the crime shortly after that. Upon their confession, Etta Smith was released from custody. All of a sudden, somebody appeared at my cell door, unlocked it, and said, come on, you're free to go. I didn't know why, didn't care why. I just wanted out of there. December 21st, 1980. The trio admitted to seizing an opportunity at a stoplight. The trio forcibly entered Miss Uribe's truck, steering her towards a desolate canyon 15 miles north from her home. There, they subjected her to unspeakable atrocities, robbing, assaulting, and mercilessly beating her as she pleaded for her life. The ultimate cruelty manifested in her cause of death blunt force trauma inflicted by a large rock. The wheels of justice turned, leading to the conviction of these assailants, who now serve time behind prison bars. The extraordinary circumstances of the case of Melanie Uribe questioned the legitimacy of information brought through means beyond explanation. To date, there seems to be no explanation of how Etta saw and knew the location of a victim who she had no connection to. A vision without justice would most likely not be delivered. There is little information on the reason as to why Melanie was targeted. There are many speculations. However, no conclusive answers were ever obtained. As the curtain falls on this riveting tale, we invite you to join in on the conversation. Do you think Etta's vision was an extraordinary twist of fate or a mere coincidence? What do you think about the intricate dance between skepticism and intuition that unfolded in Melanie Uribe's case? Do you think that there is a place for psychics in police investigations? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Your insights add depth to the narratives we explore. We're eager to hear from you. If there's a case that has captured your intrigue or a mystery you'd like us to unravel, don't hesitate to share your suggestions or drop your recommendations in the comment section below. For more captivating true crime stories that unravel the enigmatic threads of human nature, like, share, and subscribe to our channel. My name is Mario Martinez. I'm a police lieutenant with the Garden Grove Police Department and the Public Information Officer. Today we'll be providing you with information regarding two cold case homicides that have been recently solved due to the use of investigative genetic genealogy. On May 21st, 1987, a tragedy unfolded in Garden Grove, Orange County when 23-year-old Shannon Rose Lloyd was discovered lifeless in her rented bedroom. The circumstances were harrowing, as she had been subjected to a stern assault and ultimately strangled. This case, which remained a mystery for years, took a startling turn in 2003. It was then that a significant breakthrough in forensic science linked Shannon's tragic demise to another equally disturbing case, the murder of 27-year-old Rene Cuevas in 1989. Renee's body was found in a location not far from a marine base, also in Orange County. The connection between these two cases, separated by years and circumstances, opened a new chapter in an investigation that had long been at a standstill. This connection between two tragic events years apart opened a new chapter in a long-standing mystery. How did the authorities connect these two cases after such a long time? What breakthrough led to the solving of these cold cases after decades? I am pleased to announce that the Garden Grove Police Department 
with the assistance and partnership of the Orange County District Attorney's Office and the Orange County Sheriff's Department have recently solved two cold case homicides. These homicides happened 21 months apart and in two different jurisdictions, but were committed by the same suspect. Orange County, California is a diverse and vibrant area in Southern California, boasting a mix of 34 municipalities. Known for its beautiful beaches, famous surfing spots, and popular amusement parks like Disneyland and Knott's Berry Farm, it's a prime tourist destination. The county is home to over 3 million people, making it the fifth largest in the U.S. While it enjoys a reputation for safety, some areas do experience gang activity. Amidst this backdrop was the cold case of Shannon Rose Lloyd and Renee Cuevas, whose tragic ends in this very county remained unsolved for decades. Born in 1964, Shannon Rose Lloyd was a vibrant 23-year-old living in Garden Grove, California. Known for her tomboyish charm and an adventurous spirit, Shannon had a unique zest for life. Her love for horses was just one aspect of her multifaceted personality. Details about her work life and family background, including her parents' names, were lesser known, painting a picture of a young woman whose life story was still unfolding. Shannon's friends remember her as a wild child of the time, always up for an adventure. Hanging out with her meant a spontaneous journey with no set destination. Her brother Tom Lloyd shared her enthusiasm for life, adding to the dynamic energy of their circle. According to a friend of hers, Shannon was speculated to be a mother to a young son, showing a tender side to her otherwise free-spirited nature. Her relationship with her boyfriend Farmer was a testament to love and patience. Despite her youthful energy and reluctance to settle down, Farmer's devotion to Shannon was evident. He often sought her out, a gesture reflecting his deep care for her. Shannon's social circle included Brian Schultz, John Beckman, and Roger Fillion. They were a tight-knit group, known for their camaraderie and shared love for fun and freedom. Renee Cuevas, born in 1960, was a 27-year-old resident of Orange County, California. She was deeply cherished by her family, including her grandmother Mercedes, affectionately known as Ama. Renee's life was intertwined with her siblings, Michael, Kelly, Victor, and her sister Marlene. They all shared a close bond, enveloped in familial love. This love extended to her aunt Amelia, who held a special place in her heart for Renee. Tragically, all these family members have since passed away. Renee was a devoted mother to her son, Louis Ramirez, who was the spitting image of her. Louis was the center of her world, her pride and joy. She showered him with unconditional love, always ensuring he had little gifts, candies, toys, clothes. In Louis's eyes, his mother was everything. Renee's physical beauty was striking with long brownish-red hair and fair snow-white skin. Her smile, adorned with the cutest dimples, radiated happiness. These same dimples were a charming trait passed on to Louis. Renee's angelic presence was felt by everyone around her. One memorable moment was when she excitedly shared her spiritual journey of being born again, her enthusiasm making her seem like a dancing angel. This vibrant, beautiful woman's life was tragically cut short, leaving a void in the hearts of those who loved her. In 1987, Shannon Rose Lloyd, then 23 years old, was living in a room she rented in Northern Garden Grove. Her home was located in the 11,900 block of Donna Lane, a quiet part of the neighborhood. The house belonged to 70-year-old Kasimar Bursuk, who provided Shannon with a place to stay. It was a commonplace residence in a typical Orange County suburb, where everyone expected the usual calm of everyday life. 
However, on May 21st of that year, an unthinkable tragedy shattered the quiet of this community. Kesemar Bursuk, the homeowner and Shannon's landlord, made a horrifying discovery. He found Shannon's lifeless body in her room, a scene that no one, including him, was ever prepared to witness. In a state of shock and urgency, Kasimar rushed to a neighbor's house desperate for help. He needed to contact the authorities immediately to report the dreadful scene he had stumbled upon. The police were called to the scene, marking the beginning of a long, complex investigation into Shannon's untimely death. This day marked a turning point not just in the life of Shannon's close ones, but also in the annals of Orange County's criminal history. The peaceful facade of the neighborhood was forever altered by this tragic event. Two years after the heart-wrenching discovery of Shannon Rose Lloyd's body, another tragic event unfolded in Orange County. In the early hours of February 19, 1989, an unsettling discovery was made near the El Toro Marine Base along Lambert Road. It was there that the lifeless body of Rene Cuevas, then 27 years old, was found. This grim discovery was made by an anonymous individual who, upon encountering such a harrowing scene, promptly alerted the police. The area near El Toro Marine Base, typically associated with the disciplined life of military personnel, suddenly became a scene of a criminal investigation. The quiet of the early morning was disrupted by the flurry of police activity as they arrived to uncover the details of this tragic incident. Renee's death, coming just two years after Shannon's, added another layer of sorrow and mystery to the community of Orange County. The proximity of these two cases, both in time and geography, raised numerous questions and concerns. The serene and orderly environment of the area was once again overshadowed by the darkness of an unsolved crime, leaving the community and Renee's loved ones in a state of shock and grief. Immediately following the discovery of Shannon Rose Lloyd's body, the police launched an intensive investigation into her untimely death. They soon uncovered the tragic details. Shannon had been inhumanely assaulted and strangled in her own bedroom. This revelation sent shockwaves through the community, adding a grim dimension to the already tragic event. Neighbors described Shannon as an attractive, petite woman, known to be a mother and to have a boyfriend who frequently visited her. However, they also noted that, occasionally, some less than reputable individuals were seen at her residence. This detail added complexity to the case, as it broadened the potential circle of people who might have been involved in or have knowledge about her final hours. Intriguingly, the police had been called to Shannon's residence on three separate occasions before, for reasons that remain unclear. Adding to the mystery, neighbors reported that burglaries were common in the area at the time. Yet in Shannon's case, there was no evidence of forced entry into the house, and no belongings appeared to be missing. This lack of disturbance at the crime scene suggested a perpetrator who may have been familiar with Shannon or her home. Despite these details, the investigation hit a dead end. Without any clear suspects or leads, Shannon Rose Lloyd's case turned cold. When Renee Cuevas' body was discovered, the police immediately began an investigation parallel to that of Shannon Rose Lloyd's case. The circumstances surrounding Renee's death bore a chilling resemblance to Shannon's. She too had been inhumanely assaulted and strangled. This horrifying similarity suggested a pattern, an alarming thought for the investigators and the community alike. Despite the earnest efforts of the police, the investigation into Renee's death encountered significant challenges. Like Shannon's case, there were no clear leads or suspects to pursue. 
The lack of evidence and witnesses left the police with few avenues to explore. This absence of concrete information made it increasingly difficult to piece together the events leading up to Renee's tragic demise. As time passed, the momentum of the investigation slowed. The clues that were available led to dead ends, and the trail of the perpetrator grew cold. In a remarkable turn of events, the year 2003 brought a significant breakthrough in the cold cases of Shannon Rose Lloyd and Renee Cuevas. The persistence of law enforcement led to the reinvestigation of Shannon's case, nearly two decades after her untimely death. This time, with advances in forensic technology, the DNA evidence found at the crime scene was uploaded to CODIS, the Combined DNA Index System. This system, a national database for storing DNA profiles, provided a new hope in solving these long-standing mysteries. The CODIS results delivered a shocking revelation. The DNA from Shannon's case matched the DNA from Renee's murder. This discovery confirmed a grim reality. The same individual was responsible for both crimes. In 2003, the Orange County Crime Lab conducted forensic testing on evidence found at the scene, and a male DNA profile was collected. It was at this time that male DNA profile was also a match to a suspect DNA profile found at the scene of a 1989 Orange County Sheriff's Department cold case homicide. The victim in that case was 27-year-old female Renee Cuevas. However, even with this crucial piece of evidence, the identity of the killer remained elusive. The DNA did not immediately lead to a suspect, leaving the investigators with more work to do. The breakthrough finally came in 2021, almost two decades later when the DNA evidence from both cases was subjected to forensic genetic genealogy. This cutting-edge approach, which combines DNA analysis with genealogical research, opened a new chapter in the investigation. From this intricate process, investigators were able to identify a potential suspect. In 2021, the cases were submitted to the Orange County District Attorney's Office, investigating genetic gene genealogy unit. This team of scientists and investigators were able to identify a possible suspect, Reuben J. Smith. Reuben J. Smith, the perpetrator behind the tragic cases of Shannon Rose Lloyd and Renee Cuevas, was born on December 11, 1959. He originated from the state of Michigan, a place far removed from Orange County where his heinous crimes would later unfold. Despite his ties to this community in the 1980s, much of Smith's background, including his childhood experiences, education, and personal relationships, remained shrouded in mystery. Even the names of his parents were unknown, which left a blank slate regarding his early life and upbringing. In the 1990s, Smith made a significant move to Las Vegas, Nevada. This relocation marked a new chapter in his life. Yet the details of his life in Las Vegas, how he integrated into the community and what he pursued there, are largely unknown. This lack of information about Smith's personal life created a complex character, one who managed to stay under the radar, despite his criminal activities. After relocating to Las Vegas, Nevada, Reuben J. Smith's criminal activities eventually led to his arrest. In July of 1998, he was apprehended by the police on charges of inhuman assault and attempted murder of a woman. This arrest marked a turning point, as it brought Smith's actions under legal scrutiny. However, the charges against him were later dismissed, leading to his release. Tragically, in November of 1999, Smith committed suicide using a firearm in Las Vegas. This act brought an abrupt end to his life, leaving many questions unanswered. However, it was through the DNA evidence obtained from Smith's previous arrest that a crucial connection was established. 
The DNA profile obtained from Smith matched the male DNA found at the crime scenes of both Shannon Lloyd and Renee Cuevas. This conclusive evidence finally revealed the truth. Reuben J. Smith was the perpetrator, responsible for the murders of both women. The confirmation of Smith's involvement in these heinous crimes brought a sense of closure to the long-standing mystery surrounding their deaths. The resolution of the cold cases of Shannon Rose Lloyd and Renee Cuevas brought a profound sense of closure to their families, who had waited for years with unanswered questions and unresolved grief. The identification of Reuben J. Smith as the perpetrator responsible for these heinous crimes marked the end of a long, painful chapter for the loved ones of both victims. Yolande Lewis, Renee's cousin, stepped forward to express heartfelt gratitude towards the police and everyone involved in the investigation. Good morning, my name is Yolanda Louie and I am Renee Guava's cousin. Um, first of all, I want to give the glory to our Lord Jesus Christ who allowed me to be here with you today. I want to thank the detectives who worked very really hard on my cousin's case and closed it and gave closure to the family. Um, my family wishes that they could be here today, but with work and um, it being so sudden that they couldn't be here, but they are here with us, and I just want to let you guys know that um, she is deeply loved and missed. Today is a good day. Um, the men and the women working so hard brought restoration and peace to our family. I will not speak about the individual who took the life of my cousin Renee, but rather share her life with you. One of my memories of Renee is when she came to our home, she had this white book with her and claiming to have been born again. She was so excited about that, she appeared like a dancing angel to me. Now that I'm older, I am born again too, and I'm excited just as she is. If I could speak with my cousin again, I would tell her how sorry I am. I would make her laugh so I can see her beautiful dimples. Someday I will get a chance again to hug you and to tell you I love you. Save a place for me in heaven. The Garden Grove Police Chief, Amir El Fara, also gave out his statement. Many live with sadness, anger, agony, and grief. Many have questions and wonder why their loved ones were taken away from them. We hope that these cases being solved somehow bring some closure to their families. In closing, I would like to thank the Orange County Sheriff's Department, the Orange County District Attorney's Office for our partnerships and willingness to solve these cases. I truly believe these cases were solved due to our work and dedication from our detectives from all three agencies and the use of the Investigative Genetic Genealogy Unit. As we close the chapter on the cold cases of Shannon Rose Lloyd and Renee Cuevas, two critical questions come to mind. Could anything have been done differently to solve these cases sooner? And what lessons can we learn from their stories to aid future investigations? We invite you to share your thoughts in the comments. And if you have a case in mind that you'd like us to explore, please don't hesitate to drop your recommendations in the comment section below. For more captivating true crime stories, remember to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Your engagement helps us delve deeper into these complex cases and bring untold stories to light. He supposedly tortured her. He lit a candle, one of her candles with her matches and dripped hot wax on her. They get into some sort of scuffle. And Carol says the guy told her that he would kill everybody in the house. She didn't stay in the room. He took her gun. Instead of going left down the hallway to exit the house, he went to the right to where my daddy was, sound asleep, and he shot my daddy in the head. 
On September 22, 1985, a 51-year-old construction worker in Houston, Texas, Roy Joe McCaleb, was shot in his room by an unknown intruder who also assaulted his wife Carolyn and then shot him in the head as he slept. This was the story police believed for 23 years, until the tables were turned to reveal the most mind-boggling mystery of the decade. Who would kill him? Why did no one hear the shot in the middle of the night? And why was the case cold for 23 years? With a population of 2.3 million, Houston is the fourth most populated as of 2022 ranking cities of the U.S. Houston's skyline showcases a mix of modern and historical architecture, reflecting its rich history and continuous development. The city is known for its cultural diversity with a population that speaks over 145 languages. As a major economic hub, Houston is home to the Texas Medical Center, the world's largest concentration of healthcare and research institutions, as well as NASA's Johnson Space Center. Although known for its bustling city life and vibrant mix of people, Houston has a steady crime rate, with the Houston Police Department reporting 23.467 crimes in 2022. Roy Joe McCaleb was born on September 3, 1934, in the Baytown area of Pelly, Texas, to Harvey Cameron and Roxy Joe Swanner, and was the two-year younger brother to James Cameron McCaleb. He graduated from Robert Lee High School in Baytown. Soon after, he joined the military and was a veteran of the Korean War between 1950 and 1953 and also served as Master Mason of the Goose Creek Masonic Lodge. He married early and had three kids, Bridget Renee McCaleb, Pamela Nally, and Alton W. McCaleb, though it ended tragically after 22 years when two of their kids were diagnosed with fatal neurological illnesses taking the life of one of his daughters, Bridget, in 1981. It was hard on the whole family. Um, there wasn't much medically that you could do for that. There was really no treatment for it. When Bridget died, um, it was very hard on our family. We had never had to deal with anything like that. I can remember when I got the phone call and I called my daddy and told him that Bridget was gone. And he, he kept telling me that everything's gonna be all right. The death was too dreadful for the couple, and they went their separate ways. His other child, Alton, was diagnosed with the same illness, eventually lost his ability to walk, and Roy was taking care of him. Roy was a loving father and brother. He was loved by his family and his kids. At age 51, Roy found himself single, and despite the heartbreak and being a single dad, he was quite open to the idea of meeting someone new. His brother introduced him to an employee who worked at the front office, 43-year-old Carolyn Sue Crison Wilson. She dressed real nice. Uh, she was pretty. Roger had the personality that he never met a stranger. He didn't really have any trouble meeting people, and he still had his looks, so he didn't have any trouble getting the women either. They hit it off immediately and had their honeymoon period. She too had a son, Greg Curzon, from the previous marriage, and being parents, they understood each other better. Soon, Roy asked Carolyn and her son to move in with him, and right after that, he asked to marry her in 1984. This was Roy's second marriage, however, it was not the same for Carolyn. She had been married seven times prior to this, and unbeknownst to Roy, she was still technically married when she met him. They both were married and everything looked fine. However, Carolyn didn't get along with Roy's kids, specifically his son Alton, who had trouble walking due to his neurological condition. Carolyn used to wear lingerie and at night, would go into his room and read out dirty magazines to him. 
and since he relied on a wheelchair, he couldn't escape the situation. After a period of this consistent bullying, Alton moved out of the family home. 1985 marked the second year of their marriage. Roy developed severe back pain, and after a lot of suffering, he went ahead and got a surgery done. Due to that, he had to sleep in the spare bedroom in order to recover. It was a Sunday, and Carolyn's son and his girlfriend were all home, and Roy kissed Carolyn goodnight before heading into the spare bedroom to sleep in. Sadly, he would never wake up. On September 22, 1985, Roy was shot dead in the head in his bedroom where he was sleeping. It was after midnight. It was my aunt, Morgan Ann. And she told me, she said, I want you to know. She said, somebody broke in the house and Carol and they shot your daddy. The Houston County police were informed. We got over to Roy Job's house and the police was there and had the yellow tape up and everything. And they won't let us in. During questioning, Carolyn stated that 10 days prior to that incident, a barefoot assailant forced himself into Carolyn's car and assaulted her. Carol said that she was on her way to work one day and she was a couple of blocks from the house at a stop sign and a man just jumped in her car and uh, made her drive down to a, a park somewhere near their house and she claimed she didn't tell anybody because she didn't want to upset my father. When asked about sharing the incident with her husband or reporting it, she stated that he was recovering from a back surgery and a heart attack and didn't want to bother him too much, so she kept it to herself. Continuing her story, she said that the same intruder entered her house on the night of September 22, 1985 from the back door. He assaulted her at knife point while scraping her with a wire hanger and dripping hot wax on her, following which he proceeded to go over to Roy's room, used a 38 caliber revolver that Carolyn kept under her pillow, and shot him. He accidentally dropped the gun when they collided, and Carolyn rushed and grabbed it and shot him twice as he fled the scene, which explained the gunpowder residue on her hand when the Houston police were called. The crime scene was sealed off, and the police took statements, collected evidence, photographed everything, and began the manhunt. She said she kept a gun underneath her pillow, and she pulls out the gun to, uh, you know, presumably stop the He grabs the gun. He's holding a knife to her throat while he's sexually assaulting her. He... Supposedly tortured her. He lit a candle, one of her candles with her matches, and dripped hot wax on her. They get into some sort of scuffle. And Carol says the guy told her that he would kill everybody in the house. She didn't stay in the room. He took her gun. Instead of going left down the hallway to exit the house, he went to the right to where my daddy was, sound asleep, and he shot my daddy in the head. And she said that when she heard a gunshot, she jumped up and ran in the hallway, and they bumped into each other. He dropped a gun, and then she fires three shots after him. But some things were definitely strange. The incident happened at night, and considering Carolyn's son and his girlfriend were in the house, how did they not hear any commotion or the gunshot? And as Carolyn stated that a random stranger assaulted her in the car, how did the same intruder follow her here and know her address as well? Carolyn also refused to take the polygraph test and also took a bath after the incident when she was specifically told not to. She even skipped the hospital examination. Additionally, in her retelling of the incident, she claimed that her assailant broke into the house. However, when investigated, police found no signs of forced entry. These questions haunted the police too, 
After not finding any lead or enemies that could have a potential motive, police turn towards Carolyn. In most cases, a spouse is always the suspect. Though most evidence was behavior-based and the police had nothing solid to follow through, eventually the case would go cold for 23 years. For months, there were no leads. Despite Roy McCaleb's daughter, Pamela, diligently reaching out to the DA each year in hopes of updates, there were no breakthroughs over the years in the pursuit of her father's killer. However, in 2008, nearly 23 years later, the case experienced a significant turn of events. The breakthrough was made possible through persistent efforts from Roy's daughter, Pamela, two Texas Rangers, and District Attorney Ken Magison, who ultimately chose to advance the case. Suspicions, ongoing background checks, and revelations that unfolded over the years played a crucial role in cracking the case wide open. Questions arose regarding the $198,000 life insurance policies that were taken out before Roy's death, which his wife had attempted to claim which she did not receive, and Roy's family put a pause on it, eventually only getting $19,000 out of the policy. She had taken out a pretty substantial amount of life insurance on Roy without his knowledge. But I was told it was for $240,000. There were also inquiries into her seemingly composed demeanor after reporting her husband's murder, and puzzlement about how her son remained undisturbed during the intruder's alleged assault on his mother. Carolyn changed her statement about the perpetrator being a white male and later confessing that he was black. She shrugged it off by saying she was embarrassed to mention his race. The inconsistencies were glaring. Despite the alleged commotion, none of the neighbors heard anything and there were no witnesses of a man entering or leaving the couple's North Shore home. Additionally, Carolyn initially described the man who assaulted her to be white, but claimed that he was black in later interrogations. Testimony from some of her previous six husbands shed light on her ability to switch from a sweet and lovable persona to a money-driven individual when her true nature was revealed. Despite this, the evidence remained circumstantial, lacking witnesses and any tangible connection between her and the shooting. At the time of the incident, she had, against police advice, washed away Roy's blood that had seeped into her nightdress as she held him. They find blood on it, but not her blood or an assailant's blood. It's blood spatter, and it's Roy McCaleb's blood. Even when accused of her husband's murder, Caroline insisted that her mysterious intruder was the culprit, maintaining her innocence and portraying herself as a victim. However, the Texas Rangers pressed her for a motive, questioning why the alleged assaulter would have killed Roy McCaleb. When confronted with this inquiry, she struggled to provide a plausible answer. Due to all evidence being circumstantial, the case dragged on for months, then years, ultimately with the trail going cold. Despite this, the Houston Police Department Sergeant Mike Peters and Roy's daughter Pamela continued their unrelenting efforts to reveal the truth. After 23 years, the case was finally taken to court again in 2008, when 71-year-old Carolyn was charged with the murder of Roy Joe McCaleb. After the arrest, Carolyn's attorney, James Stanford, made the claim that the accused had suffered from dementia, Alzheimer's, and other health issues. She also claimed that too much time had passed between the crime and court ruling, which managed to sway District Judge Kevin Fine. With Fine's dismissal, the case would bounce around from one appellate court to another for five years. Ultimately, with her health in decline, 
Carolyn Sue Krizin Wilson experienced a breakdown when the court ruling was overturned in 2013. This time, under District Judge Ryan Pantrick. Faced with the threat of a life sentence, she eventually admitted to shooting her husband in exchange for a more lenient punishment at the Harris County courtroom. The plea deal was considered the most viable option for the prosecution team to bring closure to the case. Given the absence of fresh incriminating evidence and the decades-old nature of the incident. On December 26, 2013, at the age of 71, Carolyn Sue Crison Wilson commenced a six-month prison sentence, followed by 10 years of probation. The reason for a small sentence was her amnesia and illness also given that she was 71 years old at the time. While the initial perception of the sentencing seemed lenient, considering Crison Wilson's health issues, Roy McCaleb's family finally attained the closure they had sought. After suspecting the truth for a prolonged 28 years, they had persistently sought for Carolyn's conviction in the cold-blooded murder of Roy Joel McCaleb. Roy McCaleb's family had finally achieved the closure they wanted. They had long suspected the truth and fought tirelessly for 28 long years for Carolyn Sue Crison Wilson to be convicted for the callous murder of Roy. However, while the family wasn't fully satisfied with the judgment, it was still relieving to see the woman who destroyed their family finally behind bars. As we conclude this gripping true crime journey, we invite you to reflect on the tragic tale of Roy McCaleb and the shocking revelations surrounding his murder. Do you think justice was served in Carolyn Sue Crison Wilson's case? What do you think about the complexities that unfolded over 28 years? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Your insights add depth to our discussions. And if there's a particular case you'd like us to explore next, share your suggestions in the comment section below. We value your input. For more riveting true crime stories that unravel the mysteries of our world, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Your support fuels our commitment to bringing you compelling narratives that delve into the shadows of the human experience. Until next time. Stay curious, stay informed. Radio Canada has learned police in Ontario recently cracked a murder cold case that goes back nearly 50 years. Ontario Provincial Police identified a woman whose body was found in a river near Ottawa in 1975. On May 3rd, 1975, a startling discovery was made near the Nation River, just south of Castleman, about 55 kilometers east of Ottawa. A local farmer, while inspecting the rear of his property, stumbled upon a tragic scene. The remains of a woman laying face down in the water. This was near the Highway 417 Bridge, a quiet area not known for such grim findings. Without delay, the farmer alerted the police, who quickly responded by arriving at the scene. This marked the beginning of a long-standing mystery that would puzzle investigators for decades. Who was the woman whose remains were discovered by the river? Would the farmer or the locals be holding vital clues that could lead to who she was? Ottawa a city where whispers of history echo along the whispering wall, blooms vibrantly with the Tulip Festival, and uncovers Cold War secrets at the Dyfin Bunker. It is a culinary haven from beaver tails to shawarma, surrounded by a green belt and crowned by the Rideau Canal's icy ribbon in winter. A city of firsts from Bitcoin, ATMs to innovative apples, Ottawa is a blend of bilingual education, tech innovation, and architectural marvels, reflecting a lively tapestry of culture, history, 
and modernity. Ottawa maintains a relatively low crime rate, making it a safe and appealing place to live. However, in 2023, this serene city and its thriving social circles were briefly stirred by the resolution of a cold case that had been unsolved for over half a century. In the quiet expanse of rural Ottawa, a chilling discovery was made on May 3, 1975. A farmer, while tending to the far reaches of his land near the Nation River, about 40 kilometers east of Ottawa, spotted an unusual sight in the water. As he approached, he realized it was a woman's body, laying face down. Acting responsibly, he immediately contacted the police. The Ottawa Police Department responded promptly. What they found was a scene that was both perplexing and horrifying. The woman's body was bloated and naked, with only a cloth obscuring her face. A dark blue leotard top was gathered around her neck, hinting at a struggle or forced positioning. Her hands were bound in front of her, with a blue necktie adorned with Canadian flags, a symbol of national pride, now turned into a tool of restraint. Her ankles were similarly bound, but with two additional men's ties, adding to the bizarre and tragic tableau. Wrapped around her head were two pieces of fabric, one a bloody green piece, the other a disposable hand towel. But what stood out was a distinctive Irish linen tea towel, a common household item turned into an instrument of concealment. Adding to the grim scene, loosely wrapped around her neck was a television cable, and a piece of a curtain rod runner was found tucked under her armpit. This discovery was not just a case of an unidentified body. It was a scene that spoke of violence, struggle, and mystery. The use of everyday items like neckties, a tea towel, and a curtain rod piece painted a picture of an unplanned, possibly frenzied attack. The location, a serene river far from the hustle of city life, added to the eerie nature of the crime. The investigation into the tragic discovery near the Nation River in 75 was a meticulous and challenging endeavor for the Ottawa Police Department. The autopsy revealed that the woman was between 25 and 35 years old. She had shoulder-length hair dyed red, though it was believed to be naturally brown. Her eyes were either hazel or blue, and she weighed around 100 pounds and stood at 5 feet 5 inches tall. Notably, both her fingernails and toenails were painted red, and she had high-quality partial dentures with multiple fillings, suggesting a middle-class background. Investigators noted that she had never had children and had undergone an appendectomy. Interestingly, she had consumed a large meal shortly before her death. Her larynx was fractured, and the case was ruled a homicide. Due to the body's decomposition, it was unclear if she had been physically assaulted. It was estimated that her body had been in the river for one to four weeks, placing her time of death between April 5th and April 26th. The police believed she had been dumped into the river from a nearby bridge. During their investigation, they found blood on the bridge, but it wasn't sufficient to determine a blood type. Heavy rain on April 19th led authorities to believe she was dumped between April 19th and the 26th. Despite extensive efforts, the police faced a significant hurdle. They couldn't identify the woman. They combed through hundreds of missing person reports and contacted local dentists as the Jane Doe had a custom denture and several fillings. Her forensic dental imprints were published in dental journals across North America 
and overseas, but no one recognized them. Law enforcement officers knocked on doors within a 25-kilometer radius of the bridge and tracked down to where the TV cable had been sold. They checked hotels and motels for potential leads, but they found nothing. The necktie used to bind her was made in Montreal and sold throughout Ontario and Quebec. The Irish tea towel, imported by a Toronto company, was sold in large quantities until 1972. Yet none of these leads brought them any closer to her identity. The questions of her origins remained a mystery. She was then nicknamed the Nation River Lady, and she remained in a Toronto morgue until 1987, 12 years after her discovery. Eventually, she was buried in Toronto's Mount Pleasant Cemetery. News of her burial brought in some fresh tips, but they all led to dead ends. Over the years, the Nation River Lady would periodically resurface in the news, with new sketches and advancements in forensic technology. But still, her identity remained unknown. This case, spanning over decades, became a haunting enigma in Canadian crime history. The lack of identity not only hampered the investigation, but also added a layer of tragedy to the case. The case eventually went cold. For years, the identity of the Nation River Lady remained a mystery, a cold case that seemed destined to remain unsolved. Despite the use of forensic artist renderings and 3D facial approximation technology in 2017 and the establishment of a dedicated tip line, the Ottawa Police Department's efforts to identify her were met with silence. The case which had haunted the community and baffled investigators seemed to be at a standstill. However, a significant breakthrough came in 2019. In a collaborative decision with the Chief Coroner and the Center of Forensic Science in Toronto, authorities made the pivotal choice to exhume her body to obtain a new DNA profile. This decision marked a turning point in the investigation. The Ontario Provincial Police, or OPP, announced that advancements in DNA science had enabled them to create a clear DNA profile of the victim. In 2020, a critical step was taken when investigators shared the victim's DNA samples with the DNA Doe Project, a laboratory in the United States specializing in forensic genealogy. This collaboration represented the first use in Canada of such technology to identify a victim. The DNA Doe Project, through meticulous research and analysis, managed to make a connection. They spoke with surviving relatives and were able to confirm the Nation River Lady's identity with her family. I would like to welcome and thank our partner, Dr. Dirk Heyer, the Chief Coroner for the Province of Ontario, for making himself available for this very important announcement. Today we have a significant update to one of the oldest, unsolved, and most unique unidentified remains investigations in OPP history. This unidentified remains investigation that was ultimately linked to a missing person file from out of our province began in 1975, just east of Ottawa. The woman, who had been known only as Nation River Lady for so many years, was finally identified as Jewel Parchman Langford. However, her identity was not revealed to the public until 2023, maintaining respect for the family's privacy and the ongoing investigation. C. Luritsen, the team leader at the DNA Doe Project, reflected on the breakthrough in a press release. Once we got close, we uncovered newspaper articles specifically mentioning Jewel Langford's disappearance. She was practically there waiting for us to find her, Lorstin said. This statement underscored the significance of the discovery. Not just as a technological triumph, 
but as a poignant moment of closure for those who had long sought answers. In a further development, the police announced that they had a suspect in custody, responsible for Langford's death. The suspect was named Rodney Nichols. Jewel Lala Parchman Langford, born on March 30, 1927, in Tennessee, USA, was a remarkable figure in her community. Daughter of Little Mitchell Parchman and Igla May Cutts Parchman, she grew up with siblings, infant Catherine Marie, Kenneth Way, Lois D., and Ronald Hugh Parchman. At 48, Jewel was not just a family member, but a prominent businesswoman in Jackson, Tennessee. She co-owned a successful health spa with her husband, showcasing her entrepreneurial spirit. Jewel's influence extended beyond business. She was the chair and president of the Jackson, Tennessee chapter of the American Businesswoman's Association. Her leadership and mentorship were widely recognized, earning her the title of Woman of the Year in 1971. Her colleagues admired her enthusiasm and innovative approach. In April of 1975, Jewel traveled to Montreal and never returned leaving a void in her community and family. Her disappearance was reported by her family in Tennessee, who spent years searching for her. Tragically, her mother and family passed away without knowing what had happened to her. Rodney Mervyn Nichols, an 81-year-old man, found himself at the center of a decades-old cold case. Arrested in Hollywood, Florida on July 25, 2023, Following a request by the Ontario Provincial Police, Nichols' past finally caught up with him. He confessed to the murder of his girlfriend, Jewel Parchman Langford, nearly 50 years after the crime. Driven by a need to come clean, as revealed in federal court documents. Nichols' confession came after a telephone consultation with a legal aid lawyer in Canada. He admitted to an altercation with Langford in his Montreal home, which tragically ended with him dumping her body in the Nation River. His confession marked a stark contrast to his initial interactions with the police. Back in June of 1975, Nichols had spun a web of lies. He told investigators that Langford intoxicated had plans to travel across Canada. Despite his pleas for her to stay, she was gone the next morning. He even claimed to have received a phone call from her, promising to return for his birthday. However, these stories unraveled when authorities determined that Lankford's body had been in the Nation River since May of 1975, contradicting Nichols' account of a June phone call. Living in a retirement home in Florida, Nichols initially denied any involvement in Langford's death when interviewed in 2022. His story shifted multiple times, from claiming she drowned after their boat capsized to admitting he tried to drown her, before finally confessing to the murder at his Montreal home. An extradition hearing for Nichols was scheduled for September of 2023. As the case is ongoing, details of the hearing remain undisclosed to the public. The resolution of the Jewel Parchman Langford cold case brought a bittersweet closure to a mystery that had lingered for nearly five decades. While Jewel's parents and siblings passed away without knowing her fate, it was the surviving relatives who provided the crucial clue leading to the identification of her remains and the apprehension of a suspect. Denise Chung, Langford's niece, expressed her mixed emotions in an interview with Radio Canada. As far as closure, I don't think that would come until he's, found, he's tried in court, but there is relief that at least we do um, have her back here with us, and we know what happened. Of course, we want to see justice be served and um, him tried for, for what uh, he allegedly has done. 
I want to thank everybody that has been involved in this and put forth um, any effort at all to help bring this around. And uh, I would love to say for anybody out there that's got a missing person, uh, loved one missing, not to give up hope because we pretty well had. And I realize now that people do care. And even if you don't see what's being done, odds are that there's people in the background working hard to try to solve the case. The Ontario Provincial Police confirmed on Wednesday that the human remains found east of Ottawa in 1975 were indeed those of Langford. This confirmation came as a result of the relentless efforts of law enforcement and the invaluable contribution of DNA from Langford's relatives. Chung and her family had been aware of this breakthrough since 2020, when their DNA played a pivotal role in cracking what Deputy Commissioner Marty Kearns described as one of the oldest unsolved and most unique unidentified remains investigations in OPP history. So what do you think so far about the Jewel Langford cold case? Is there a different approach you feel the detectives could have taken in finding her killer in time? We'd love to hear your thoughts on this case. If there's a particular case you'd like us to cover, please don't hesitate to drop your recommendations in the comment section below. For more captivating true crime stories, remember to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Your engagement helps us bring more of these intriguing stories to light. On December 25, 2017, in the shallow inlet Sandy Point, Australia, a snorkeler found some skeletal remains, devoid of identity. After informing the local authorities, the case led to the Victorian Institute for Forensic Medicine. As details emerged, a male, aged 21 to 37, 170 centimeters tall, radiocarbon dating from 1666 to 1942, the mystery deepens. DNA databases offered no matches, fueling a forensic genetic genealogy venture. The breakthrough unveils tantalizing clues about Sandy Point John Doe's past. How does one grapple with history hidden beneath the waves? And, in the festive season's broad daylight, how did a mystery stretch across decades? Sandy Point is a township in South Gippsland, Victoria, near Wilson's Promontory. Sandy Point stands out as the perfect destination for a laid-back summer holiday, particularly if you're accompanied by little ones. Devoid of high-rise buildings and commercial developments, it transports you to a more serene era, providing an excellent opportunity to truly rejuvenate, reconnect, and unwind. In the 2016 census, the population of the city was around 270, but it grew to thousands during the holiday time. The crime rate is close to zero and is usually considered a very safe space even for travelers. On Christmas Day in 2017, a snorkeler found some skeletal remains at Shallow Inlet, Sandy Point, Victoria. Little did he know it would initiate an investigation into a 95-year-old mystery. Skeletal remains bare of tissue, clothing, or personal effects were discovered on the ocean floor. With no contextual information or clues to the individual's identity, the Victoria Police reported the death to the coroner, leading to the transfer of the remains to the Victorian Institute for Forensic Medicine, or VIFM. As the VIFM's team of experts conducted scientific tests, they gleaned insights into the characteristics of the unknown person. The forensic anthropologist deduced that the remains belonged to a Caucasian male, aged somewhere between 21 and 37 years old, standing at approximately 170 centimeters tall. Delving into dental restorations, the forensic odontologist hinted at the intriguing possibility of an overseas origin from history. The Victorian Institute for Forensic Medicine launched a pilot program to harness forensic genetic genealogy, aiming to solve multiple Australian cold cases, collaborating with Othram. 
Othram employs an integrated approach, combining laboratory science, software development, and streamlined processes to strengthen the justice system's infrastructure. Their technology aids law enforcement at various levels in the United States and internationally, enabling breakthroughs in forensic DNA analysis for previously unsolved cases. Notably, Othram conducted all casework-related services in-house, emphasizing control and efficiency. Othram forwarded forensic evidence to their laboratory located in the woodlands in Texas. The revelation unfolded that the remains were those of Christopher Luke Moore, a World War I veteran, and a farmer in the Gippsland region, who tragically drowned in Waratah Bay in 1928. In the weeks following his drowning, a Sandy Point farmer made a surprising discovery at Shallow Inlet. Upon closer inspection and the identification of unique dental work, Christopher's father confirmed that the mandible belonged to his son. This confirmation was officially recognized during a subsequent coronial inquest held on January 24, 1929. The remains discovered in 2017 were conclusively identified as additional remains of Moore. This confirmation came through a grandniece, who verified that he had drowned in 1928, and the family had buried his mandible. A number of Australian investigators from the VIFM and other Australian police forces, working with the help and mentorship of Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick, took on the case. After engaging Othram to sequence DNA from the remains, they conducted genealogical research that eventually led to the identification of Sandy Point John Doe as 29-year-old Christopher Luke Moore, a local farmer and World War I veteran who had drowned in 1928. Despite the earnest efforts of his grief-stricken father, Cornelius Ignatius Moore, the body was never recovered. During a visit to Waratah Bay with his parents, Cornelius and Charlotte brother Francis, wife Elizabeth, and his daughter Mary. Mr. Moore disappeared beneath the waves, leaving an indelible void. Miraculously, a fortnight later on January 15, 1929, a lower jawbone confirmed through dental records to belong to Mr. Moore washed ashore approximately six kilometers from the site of the drowning. The remains found a final resting place in the Moore family plot at Menian. Over the years, Cornelius and Charlotte joined their son, in 1939 and 1946 respectively, followed by his wife Elizabeth Agnes in 1985. More recently, his daughter was laid to rest alongside them. Kathy Hogan, the great-niece of Christopher Moore, spoke on Gippsland ABC Radio expressing her appreciation for the exceptional work done by the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine team in solving the mystery and providing closure for the family. In her radio interview, Miss Hogan shared that her knowledge of the tragic story was initially limited, learning from her mother that Christopher had gone missing and the family was uncertain about the circumstances. Now, with the investigation's findings, they have a comprehensive understanding of the events. The research conducted by the forensic team not only unraveled the mystery, but also presented the family with newspaper articles and the coroner's report from 1929, offering additional insights. Miss Hogan described the emotional yet fascinating experience of discovering the complete story. After six years of investigations, the family is finally able to lay Mr. Moore to rest. This allows Mr. Moore to be reunited with his family, including the jawbone originally found in 1929. Fiona Leahy, a member of the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine's team, shared the exhaustive efforts made to solve the century-old mystery. She highlighted the initial challenges in identifying the person based on skeletal remains in 2017. However, through DNA analysis and odontology, they pieced together significant details about Mr. Moore's identity, including his Northern European ancestry, likely blue eyes, dark hair, and specific dental features. 
This information played a crucial role in narrowing down the historical research and identifying the individual who had drowned in the bay. As we conclude this riveting journey into the mystery surrounding Sandy Point John Doe, we leave you with two lingering questions. Do you think the use of forensic genetic genealogy is a groundbreaking leap in solving cold cases? And what do you think about the collaborative efforts that brought Christopher Luke Moore's identity back to light? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. We're eager to hear your insights and theories about this incredible case. If you have a particular case you'd like us to delve into next, drop your recommendations into the comment section. Your suggestions could be the key to unlocking the next compelling mystery. Your engagement means the world to us. For more captivating true crime stories and to stay updated on our investigations, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Until next time, stay curious, stay vigilant, and keep exploring the mysteries that shape our past. Thank you for joining us on this fascinating journey. They set up this pretty elaborate plan on how to get him out of his apartment, get him into a remote area, and then put your arm around his neck and shoot him in the back of the head. On the evening of December 23, 1998, a 911 call in San Diego led firefighters to a startling scene on La Jolla Scenic Drive. 911 emergency. Yes, we just heard a huge boom, like a gas explosion or a car blew up. They found a car engulfed in flames. As the smoke cleared, a horrifying sight emerged the charred remains of someone in the passenger seat. The car bearing Kansas license plates was registered to 38-year-old David Stevens from Pacific Beach, San Diego. This grim discovery marked the beginning of a mysterious case. Who was David Stevens? And what led to this tragic event along one of San Diego's most scenic routes? San Diego, California, a vibrant city known for its stunning beaches, parks, and year-round Mediterranean climate, is also recognized for its strong association with the United States Navy and as a center for healthcare and biotechnology. Home to over 1.3 million residents, it's the eighth most populous city in the United States and the second most in California. San Diego's rich history dating back to its founding in 1769 and its diverse population contribute to a unique lifestyle that balances recreational opportunities with a deep sense of history. Despite its many attractions like any major city, San Diego has its challenges with crime. And it's the location of the cold case of David Allen Stevens that was recently solved in 2023. David Allen Stevens, born on October 23, 1960, in Osmond, Pierce County, Nebraska, led a life that, until his untimely death, remained somewhat of an enigma. His father, Gerald Lloyd Stevens, is known, but details about his mother and early life remain scarce. What is known, however, paints a picture of a man who held a significant role in the corporate world. He served as a marketing manager at Perfect Match, a dating service. His position likely provided him with unique insights into the dynamics of personal relationships, an irony not lost considering the mysterious circumstances surrounding his own personal life and tragic end. In the late hours of a seemingly ordinary day on December 23, 1998, in San Diego, a sudden explosion shattered the calm. Witnesses reported a loud boom, reminiscent of a gas explosion, prompting an immediate response from the San Diego Fire Department. They rushed to La Jolla Scenic Drive, where they encountered a vehicle consumed by flames. 
As firefighters battled the blaze, a journalist captured the scene, recording as the fire was extinguished. When the smoke began to clear, a chilling discovery was made. In the passenger seat of the car, the charred remains of a human body were visible, marking the onset of a complex investigation. The car's license plates issued from Kansas were traced back to 38-year-old David Stevens, a resident of Pacific Beach, San Diego. The mystery deepened as homicide detectives turned their attention to Stevens' apartment at Pacific Beach, searching for any clues that might reveal the events leading up to his death. Inside, they found signs that suggested he wasn't alone on his last night. Discarded in the bedroom's wastebasket was a contraceptive wrapper and a tube of KY jelly. Two glasses stood on the nightstand, one with lipstick marks, hinting at the presence of a woman. In the bathroom, strands of long, straight black hair, likely female, were found. As I made my way into the bedroom, I found a, uh, a discarded wrapper for a condom in the wastebasket, as well as a tube of KY jelly. Uh, there was also two glasses on that same nightstand, one of which had lipstick on it. In the bathroom, I found strands of black hair. They were long and straight, appeared to be a female's hair. The bedroom provided more intriguing clues. Investigator Joseph Cristanziani, one of the homicide investigators from the San Diego Police Department, noted two sets of fingerprints on the mirrored headboard of Stephen's bed. One set was noticeably larger than the other, indicating the likely involvement of both a man and a woman. What struck me as unusual about these fingerprints were two things. A, it was almost ten fingers, as in two hands. I had two sets of hands. One was obviously larger than the other, which would indicate a man and perhaps a woman's fingerprints. We were real confident. It was very obvious that uh, someone recently had sex uh, in that apartment. The positioning and number of fingerprints suggested a recent, intimate encounter had taken place in the apartment. With these discoveries, detectives began to piece together the events of that fateful night. They focused on collecting physical evidence, particularly the smaller set of prints and the black hairs, as they pointed to a woman's involvement. This evidence was crucial, suggesting that the woman might have been with Stevens shortly before his untimely death. As the investigation into David Allen Stevens' death progressed, the police focused on identifying the mysterious woman, potentially linked to his final hours. Their search led them to a nearby topless bar named Dancers. There was a little topless bar uh, right next door called Dancers. And we would go there two or three times a week. And that was the only place that I could think of that he would have met someone. A place Stevens was known to frequent. Detective John Taft, one of the detectives from the San Diego Police Department working on the case, visited the club, sharing Stephen's picture with patrons and staff. A lot of them knew the guy. He was a regular customer. They were upset about it. All the employees were always made available to us. Many of the employees came down, provided DNA samples, uh, fingerprints, uh, whatever we wanted. Unfortunately, none of the fingerprints from the dancers matched those found in his bedroom leaving the police without any solid leads on the identity of the woman. In a bid to uncover new information, Detective John R. Young, another dedicated detective from the San Diego Police Department, decided to explore a different avenue. He delved into Stephen's personal belongings, specifically his address book. An entry he had in his day organizer, which he had a smiley face and there was a name associated with it. I learned that that had not been followed up on, so I contacted the person whose phone number that was, and it turned out to be one of the dancers that we had not yet talked to. When Young interviewed her, she described her relationship with Stevens as casually friendly. Eager to see if this new lead would bear fruit, her fingerprints were compared with those found in the apartment. Yet again, there was no match. Four months had passed since Stevens was tragically found in his car, and with no new leads or matches, the case slowly turned cold. 
For a little over two years, the case of David Allen Stevens' mysterious death lay dormant in the cold files, with no significant leads or breakthroughs. Then, in a stroke of strategic thinking, San Diego homicide detectives decided to capitalize on a major event, Super Bowl 35, on January 28, 2001. As the Baltimore Ravens and New York Giants geared up for the game, a large television audience was anticipated. Seizing this opportunity, detectives ran a Crime Stopper spot during the game, flashing David Stevens' picture and requesting help from the public. The following day, a pivotal moment occurred. An anonymous female called in with potentially crucial information. There was an individual in a, at a party, Super Bowl party, with several other people. And when that was shown, this woman goes, uh, that person that was involved in that killing is a friend of mine. And she then telephoned the police and said, you should go talk to this person. She knows something about your killing. The caller pointed detectives towards a suspect, the same dancer who had previously claimed to be just friends with David Stevens. Although her DNA and fingerprints didn't match the evidence at the crime scene, her DNA and her fingerprints didn't match, so physically we couldn't put her at the crime scene. Detectives couldn't dismiss this new lead. It was more than just a coincidence, they felt. For the next six months, detectives tirelessly worked the dance club angle, hoping to uncover something concrete. Despite their diligent efforts, they kept coming up empty, unable to link anyone definitively to the crime. However, in November of 2001, another significant call came through to the homicide team. I was actually sitting at my desk in the homicide office when the secretary got the call. It says, I have a friend who's an eyewitness to a murder and she needs to talk to somebody. So she transfers the call to me. I speak briefly with the friend who in turn puts me on the phone. The woman on the line was 21-year-old Nai Norn, who claimed to have vital information about David Stevens' murder. Norn revealed that David Stevens had been her supervisor at Perfect Match and also her lover. She held a crucial piece of the puzzle the name of the man who killed Stevens, Ronald Barker, who was 35 years old at the time of committing the murder. This revelation breathed new life into the case, providing detectives with a concrete lead to pursue. She was seeing him on the side and she was becoming kind of dis, uh, dissatisfied with him, and David was expressing an interest in that. With this new information, the investigation gained momentum as detectives sought to unravel the connection between Nye Norn, Ronald Barker, and the tragic fate of David Allen Stevens. Ronald Barker, born in 1963, and Nye Norn, born in 1980, emerged as the central figures in the tragic case of David Allen Stevens. Barker's early life and family background remain largely unknown, shrouded in the shadows of his later actions. Norn's life, on the other hand, was marked by hardship from the beginning. Born in a Thai refugee camp after her mother fled the horrors in Cambodia, she came to the United States at the age of five, settling initially in Florida before moving to San Diego. There, Norn's life was further marred by domestic turbulence, with her stepfather's abusive behavior creating a fraught home environment. Norn worked as a telemarketer at Perfect Match, where she met David Stevens. It was there she also encountered Barker, who she found online and entered into an intense relationship with, despite him being a married 35-year-old man and her being only 18. As Norn's relationship with Stevens evolved from workplace flirtation to planning their first date, her affair with Barker simmered in the background. You guys have sex on it? However, Norn grew increasingly dissatisfied with Barker. On the same night Stevens was killed, Norn had earlier left his apartment at 3 a.m. She returned home to find Barker waiting in a jealous rage. In a bid to cover her infidelity, she told Barker that her encounter with Stevens was non-consensual. 
And what happened was, is basically she related to us, is that she met with David, uh, had sex with him that night, and then Ron found out about it, and then Ron Barker killed him. Norn later revealed to police that Barker, in a fit of jealousy, shot and killed Stevens, and then set his car on fire. She claimed she was present during the murder, but was powerless to stop Barker. She portrayed herself as another victim of Barker's rage, implicating him as the jealous boyfriend who executed the murder. To corroborate her story, Norn agreed to a police request to phone Barker and discuss the incident while they recorded the conversation. She's implicating Barker as the person who's the jealous boyfriend who actually kills Stevens and uh, burns up his car. And I said, are you willing to phone him and talk about this while we record it? Because now it's no longer her word, it'll be their word. And so she was willing to do that. She got me involved with this, and okay. I still have nothing to do for her. Okay. So you feel betrayed by her? Exactly. So basically she betrayed, she betrayed me, and, and, and all of a sudden she decided to just walk out on me. After a while, the thing I did for her, I just had enough. And she played a game with me too much. So I'm just tired of her playing game with me, so I decided, no, I'm going to go down and take you down with me. This strategy aimed to move beyond her word against his hoping to capture an admission or any detail that could solidify the case. The investigation revealed a complex and convoluted plot. Barker admitted to following Stevens under the guise that Norn's car had broken down. When Barker flashed his lights, Norn deceived Stevens, claiming it was her brother coming to help. Unaware of the impending danger, Stevens allowed Barker into the back seat of his car, where Barker then shot him twice in the head. They set up this pretty elaborate plan on how to get him out of his apartment, get him into a remote area, and then put your arm around his neck and shoot him in the back of the head. Barker confessed to setting the car on fire to destroy the evidence, and even showed burns he sustained during the act. The two kept their heinous crime a secret for almost three years their bond of secrecy enduring until their relationship deteriorated. As the case unfolded, it became clear that both Barker and Norn were deeply entangled in a web of lies and deceit, leading to the tragic end of David Allen Stevens. In November 2001, a significant turn of events occurred as the detectives arrested Ronald Barker and charged him with first-degree murder. Following this, Nine Norn was also apprehended and faced the same charge. The trial of Ronald Barker took place in January 2003 in a San Diego courtroom. In an unusual move, Barker chose to represent himself. He questioned witnesses and argued that his tape-recorded confession was coerced. However, the jury was not convinced by his defense. After only two hours of deliberation, they found Barker guilty of first-degree murder. He received a life sentence on January 27, 2003. Nine Norn's trial followed a similar path, leading to her conviction for first-degree murder. She, too, was sentenced to life in prison that same year, 2003. However, the trajectory of her case took a different turn. Norn appealed her conviction on the grounds of battered woman syndrome, arguing that her abusive past and the circumstances surrounding the crime should be taken into account. This appeal led to a reduction in her sentence to 15 years, which began in 2003. After serving 14 years in prison, Norn was released in 2017, marking the end of a long and complex chapter in the history of San Diego's criminal justice system. The resolution of David Allen Stevens' case brought long-awaited closure to his family. While they remained private and did not publicly express their thoughts, the conclusion of the trial and the subsequent sentencing of Ronald Barker and Nine Norm undoubtedly provided them with a sense of finality. For the Stevens family, this outcome likely offered a semblance of justice and hope that their loved one's tragic end was not in vain.
So what do you think about the twists and turns in the David Allen Stevens case? Could anything have been done differently to bring this case to a close sooner? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. We're always looking for new cases to explore, so if there's a particular story you'd like us to cover, please drop your recommendations in the comment section below. And for more captivating true crime stories, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. I'm the public information officer for San Mateo Police Department. You're here today to hear about a, a cold case on a grisly uh, home invasion and attempted murder of a woman who was in her San Mateo home back in 1989. On February 4th, 1989, at approximately 4.15 a.m., an intruder allegedly entered an apartment on the 3100 block of Casa del Campo, San Mateo County, California. The intruder, wielding a kitchen knife he found in the apartment and concealing his identity with a bandana, forced his way into a woman's bed. Through threats and violence, he subjected her to a horrific ordeal, combining assault, strangulation, and stabbing. Remarkably, the victim persuaded the assailant to leave and promptly alerted the authorities. How did the assailant manage to enter without a trace? And who could be this unknown intruder? San Mateo County, with a population of 764,442, is known for its proximity to Silicon Valley, impacting its lifestyle with a blend of suburban and urban vibes. There are recreational places like parks and historic sites, Adding a cultural touch, people here are diverse and often engage in tech and innovation. While the crime rate is relatively low compared to other parts of California, there's a focus on community safety. The mention of the John Harris Jr. cold case in 2023 highlights an instance of unresolved crime in this otherwise peaceful county. In the pre-dawn stillness of February 4, 1989, a serene neighborhood in San Mateo, California, was pierced by an act of violence that would haunt the 3100 block of Casa de Campo for decades. A lone male, in an unsettling breach of security, slipped into an apartment. His first act was to arm himself with a knife from the kitchen, a common household item turned weapon. The intruder's next move was to make his way to the bedroom. That's where he really crossed the line, attacking not just the victim's place, but her, personally. Climbing into the bed where she lay, the suspect initiated an attack that was both physical and psychological. In what became a struggle for life, he choked and stabbed the victim, narrowly missing her jugular vein a stroke of deadly luck that saved her life. Even in the face of such terror, the woman's will to survive proved formidable. She fought back against her attacker, a man who kept his features obscured behind the fabric of a bandana. Her resilience was remarkable, and through a combination of courage and quick thinking, she convinced him to exit the apartment. This act of convincing the assailant to leave would later be a point of interest and wonder for all who learned of the incident. The woman then immediately contacted the police. The police, upon being alerted, descended upon the scene with a sense of urgency. They conducted interviews and processed the crime scene meticulously, searching for fingerprints, DNA, or any clue that would lead them to the perpetrator. Their efforts were exhaustive, the attention to detail painstaking, but the identity of the attacker remained a mystery. As weeks turned into months and months into years, the leads grew cold and the trail went silent. The case file on the assault swelled with notes and reports, but no definitive answers. The person responsible for the heinous crime 
within the walls of that apartment, had vanished into the ether, leaving behind a victim to grapple with the aftermath and a community shaken to its core. For over 30 years, the DNA evidence collected from the scene of the Casa de Campo attack was preserved. A silent witness waiting for science to catch up. As DNA technology advanced, investigators did not let the case gather dust. They tenaciously resubmitted the DNA evidence, hoping each time for a breakthrough that would give a voice to the truth. Their persistence? paid off. In December of 2020, the continuous use of technology and forensic science intersected with the evidence from that fateful night. A match was found, an achievement that would have seemed almost magical to investigators back in 1989. The DNA pointed to a man named John Harris Jr., who, it turned out, had lived within the same neighborhood as the victim, though their paths had not knowingly crossed. John Harris Jr. had spent the past three decades under the radar. After the incident, he seemed to have moved through life in San Joaquin County, not too far from the scene of the crime, yet far enough to evade suspicion. By the time the DNA match was made, he had relocated to Arizona, the revelation that the suspect was living an ordinary life, perhaps believing that time had eroded the chances of capture, struck a chord with both the community and law enforcement. With the identification of Harris, the case that had gone cold was reignited with a new fervor. Questions that had hung in the air for years were now being addressed with fresh leads. The investigative team, armed with new evidence and a name, set out to piece together the movements and life of John Harris Jr. over the past 30 years. They needed to understand how he evaded suspicion and what ties he may have had that kept him connected to the neighborhood he once lived in. The unveiling of the suspect's identity was a seismic shift in the case providing a direction that was previously obscured. It brought a measure of hope to those who believed that the case might never be solved. And it emphasized the message that justice, no matter how delayed, is persistent. John Harris Jr., the name now stands at the center of a decades-old cold case, emerging from the shadows due to a DNA breakthrough. But who is John Harris Jr.? Born in 1966, his story, much like the crime he suspected of, is complex and enigmatic. With details of his birth, parents, and early life still obscured from public knowledge, Harris is somewhat of a phantom figure in the narrative of his own alleged crime. Believed to have lived mostly in San Joaquin County, California, Harris's life beyond the boundaries of his neighborhood remains a mystery. By 2020, he had made his home in Arizona. In the landscape of his professional life, Harris found a niche in Manteca, California, where he was employed by a company specializing in the installation of surveillance systems. A detail that carries a certain irony, given his subsequent criminal allegations. The scarcity of information on Harris paints a picture of a man who has successfully kept his life away from the public eye. What is understood is that Harris's existence wasn't conspicuous. There were no glaring signs pointing to a disturbed childhood or a troubled educational journey that the public is aware of. The absence of a known criminal history makes the sudden link to a violent crime all the more jarring. As the main suspect in an attempted murder case, Harris's DNA has irrevocably tied him to a heinous act, suggesting that beneath the veneer of an ordinary existence, there may lie a history of darker inclinations. No marital or family ties have been brought to light. Harris, in many respects, seems to be a solitary figure, 
disconnected from the relational anchors that typify most lives. The emergence of his name in connection with the case has undoubtedly sent ripples through his former community in San Joaquin County and beyond. Neighbors who might have merely nodded to Harris in passing now grapple with the chilling proximity of a man accused of a dangerous crime. At the age of 55, John Harris Jr. found his life abruptly upended. On Wednesday, the 25th of February, 2021, he was detained, facing charges of attempted murder. The long arm of the law caught up with him near his place of employment in Manteca, California. This arrest wasn't just the result of diligent police work, but a pivotal breakthrough in DNA analysis. Ed Barberini, the police chief in San Mateo, confirmed the arrest made by local detectives in collaboration with district attorney investigators. 55-year-old John Harris Jr., a resident of Manteca. Yesterday, John Harris Jr. was arrested by San Mateo detectives and district attorney's inspectors in Manteca near his uh, place of employment. It wasn't an immediate connection. It took a persistent reopening of the case by Matt Broad, an inspector with the district attorney's office, acting upon the request of district attorney inspector Kevin Raffelli. Back then, Raffelli was a sergeant with the San Mateo police, deeply involved in the investigation of this particularly disturbing case. The pursuit of justice for the atrocious crime from 1989 was relentless and the determination of the investigators was unyielding. Harris had seemingly led a nomadic life within the Bay Area, with stints in San Mateo, Alameda, San Francisco, and San Joaquin counties. Despite this, he had remained under the radar, with his DNA not present in the National Law Enforcement Database. The investigators had to pivot, exploring advanced genealogical methods to establish a connection, a technique akin to the one that unearthed the identity of the infamous Golden State killer, Joseph James D'Angelo. The DNA is, in the end, what matched him to this case, Inspector Broad stated, encapsulating the culmination of tireless investigative efforts. This scientific match would become the cornerstone of the case, irrefutably linking Harris to the crime that had haunted the community and the victims for over three decades. Raffaele, reflecting on the nature of the crime, remarked on its inhumanity and the lasting impression it left on the minds of those who worked the case. San Mateo, during that time, was not accustomed to dealing with crimes of such a horrific nature. And this particular incident had etched itself into the collective memory of the local law enforcement. District Attorney Steve Wagstaff acknowledged the complexity and sophistication of the investigative process. With Harris's DNA absent from the databases typically checked, the investigative team had to turn to more innovative methods to track down the perpetrator. Harris, following his arrest, was held in San Mateo County Jail his bail set at a steep half a million dollars. The community, once oblivious to the dark past of a seemingly ordinary man, was now faced with the chilling reality of his alleged actions. For the victim and those affected, this arrest signified a long-awaited step towards closure and justice. John Harris Jr. found himself before the bench at San Mateo County Superior Court in Redwood City on a somber Friday afternoon, February 25, 2021, to hear his charges. The gravity of the situation was palpable as he faced an arraignment for two severe offenses, attempted murder and aggravated mayhem, both carrying the stark reality of life sentences. Justice Barbarus presided over the case with a measured demeanor, reflecting the seriousness of the charges. The courtroom, adhering to Supreme Court Rule 23, understood that the decisions here would not set a precedent 
keeping the case's implications tightly bound to the present. Justice Barbaris, alongside Justices Vaughn and McKinney, formed a unanimous front in delivering the court's decision. In the complex weave of legal proceedings, John Harris Jr.'s attempt to revisit his conviction fell short. His post-conviction petition, an effort to overturn his prior guilty plea for first-degree murder, was summarily dismissed by the court. This dismissal wasn't taken lightly. It was after Harris Jr.'s appointed appellate counsel, the Office of the State Appellate Defender, or OSAD, filed a motion to withdraw citing a lack of meritorious argument for error in the court's decision. Even with the opportunity to respond, Harris Jr. remained silent, leading the court to grant the motion and affirm the dismissal. The backstory to Harris Jr.'s current predicament revealed an intricate legal tussle. Initially, he had pleaded guilty to first-degree murder in exchange for a reduced 25-year sentence. However, claims of ineffective counsel and coercion surfaced, and a subsequent crankle hearing saw his guilty plea momentarily withdrawn. The state's argument that they were unjustly excluded from the crankle hearing led to the reinstatement of the guilty plea after appointing Harris Jr. new counsel. On appeal, Harris Jr. contended that his constitutional rights were breached when the guilty plea was reinstated. The appeal was denied, with the court maintaining that the initial withdrawal was premature and, upon review, found his plea to be voluntary and informed. Harris Jr.'s subsequent post-conviction petition was an attempt to navigate through these previous rulings. He claimed new arguments of collaboration among the trial court, defense counsel, and the prosecutor. But... The court found it without merit, a verdict upheld by the OSAD, his actual innocence claim, lacking new evidence or proof, also failed to sway the court. Justice Barbarous concluded that the petition did not present any reasonably arguable issues and properly dismissed within the procedural boundaries. In the end, the court's decision was final. The motion was granted and the judgment was affirmed. Harris Jr.'s attempt to get a new trial finally came to a close, based on the principle that once a case is decided, you can't go after it again. In a recent news briefing, San Mateo Police Chief Ed Barberini conveyed the relief and gratitude of the victim in the John Harris Jr. case, which remained unresolved for over three decades. The victim, who has endured the unimaginable for 32 years, now has some closure with the apprehension of a suspect. The breakthrough in the cold case was made possible through the concerted efforts of the San Mateo County District Attorney's investigators, the FBI's San Francisco and Los Angeles divisions, Monteca Police, and the San Mateo Police Detectives. It's a testament to their dedication and the power of collaborative law enforcement. Authorities have indicated that there may be more victims out there. They are currently processing additional DNA to uncover further evidence. To aid in this ongoing investigation, San Mateo Police are encouraging anyone with information about Harris to step forward. There are multiple ways to get in touch one of which is to contact San Mateo Police Department's Investigative Bureau at 650-522-7650. Anonymous tips can be submitted to tinyurl.com slash capital SMPD tips or by calling 650-522-7676. So what are your thoughts on the resolution of the cold case after 32 years? What best approach do you think could have been taken to know the assailant in time? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Since 1986, investigators have been trying to solve Teresa Scaff's murder. But now, a big break. Polk County Sheriff Grady Judd says they now know who killed this 29-year-old registered nurse. 
10 Tampa Bay's Eric Glasser explains how a combination of modern DNA technology and some determined investigators helped to finally crack this cold case. In October of 1986, a 29-year-old nurse named Teresa Lee Scalf suffered a terrible fate in her Lakeland home when she was mercilessly assaulted and murdered. This shocking incident deeply affected the community. This once idyllic neighborhood has since been marked by this dark episode. It's not unreasonable to suggest that had it not been for such an unfortunate incident, Teresa's plain duplex would have still been just an ordinary residence until now. For 37 long years, this case went through numerous twists and turns, until finally, justice was brought about. The unsolved murder of Teresa Lee Scalf has been a haunting memory in a small Florida town. Who was the killer? And what helped shine a light on the killer's identity? Let us take you through the chilling details of the crime, the challenges faced by the investigators, and the breakthroughs that ultimately led to justice. Delve into the layers of intrigue, secrets, and a family's resilient spirit as they seek closure. It is a true crime story that transcends time, showing how one's past can finally catch up with them when they thought they had escaped it. Teresa Lee Scalf's tragic secrets unfold in the heart of Lakeland, Florida, against the backdrop of a peaceful community. This unassuming town with its dimly lit narrow streets has a story that goes beyond time. Lakeland is more than just a charming place. It has a rich history and diverse residents. Located along Interstate 4 east of Tampa and West Orland, Lakeland is the most populated city in Polk County. The town is locally referred to as Swan City due to its large swan population, who all happen to be descendants of two mute swans given by Queen Elizabeth back in 1957. In terms of human population as of 2020, Lakeland is home to over 112,641 people. However, like all places, Lakeland also experiences its share of crime that hides in the shadows, with a crime rate of 17.29 per 1,000 residents in a standard year. When we look back into Lakeland's past, we can feel the dichotomy between home being safe and familiar and the darker side of our neighborhood, which is more dangerous. The transition from the ordinary to the extraordinary in Lakeland serves as a prelude to the chilling events that unfold next door to Teresa's small house. The crime shrouded in mystery beckons us to untangle the web of secrets held by Lakeland for many years. Born on June 13, 1957, Teresa Lee Scalf was a registered trauma nurse at Lakeland General Hospital. She loved her profession, and she was only 19 years old when she became a nursing assistant. Continuing her studies, she even urged everyone in the family to join this profession. At the age of 29, she was hired at the Lakeland Regional Medical Health Center. Her brother, sister, Pam Shade, and mother Betty Scalf were also nurses. Here's what her sister had to say about Teresa. My sister signed me up for nursing school when I got out of the military, and now I've been a registered nurse for 38 years. My sister signed me up for nursing school and said, you'd be a good nurse. I had just gotten out of the military. I did not work in nursing. And I said, no. She said, oh, just go take the test. I've been a nurse 38 years now. 38 years. Almost our whole family works in healthcare pretty much due to her. My brother is a trauma nurse. My sister works in mental health. My mother worked at the hospital for 25 years. All due to her. It was all due to her. She started off at the bottom, nursing assistant. She went to respiratory school. She got her RN and was so proud. Her life was cut short by a terrible crime that occurred in her otherwise peaceful home in Lakeland. She had an eight-year-old son, Craig, by the time the tragedy happened. 
Teresa's life was like any other until that fateful night, October 27, 1986. As we go through her life details, the effect of the crime on her family, and the search for justice afterwards, Teresa's presence remains dominant as a sad reminder of how much human lives are affected by the hidden secrets behind Lakeland's calm facade. Let's go back to the night of October 27, 1986, before we start investigating what happened. What should have been an ordinary evening was interrupted by a terrible home invasion. Teresa was going about her business, oblivious to the imminent danger, when the sudden intrusion broke the silence in her house. Teresa's normal activities of that day and the abruptness of the intrusion set the stage for a terrifying crime that would unfold. The home invasion was later described as a brutal act which left Teresa's family in disbelief and turned her house into a crime scene. Teresa's life was cut short on the fateful night of October 27, 1986, within the Lakeland confines of her home. The crime scene was described as aggressive, and this cruel act left Teresa's family in shock. Betty Scalf, Teresa's mother, went over to her daughter's house to check on her when she did not report to work. Upon arriving at her daughter's doorstep, she received no response from her daughter. In an act of desperation, Betty used her credit card to pry force through the locked door, only to be met with a sight that would scare her forever. Teresa's lifeless body lay motionless, with her throat slit. Betty immediately called the authorities, and investigators and first responders from the Polk County Sheriff's Office were shortly at the scene. The rain was so heavy that it washed away crucial evidence from around the crime scene, including possible clues such as footprints, trail patterns, and trace materials. The continuous rain on the day of the murder also took away any chance of there being a witness who might have seen a person entering or leaving Teresa's home, making it difficult for investigators to uncover details about the crime. The severity of Teresa's neck wounds almost resembled decapitation, highlighted the extreme brutality of the crime. Additionally, she had defensive wounds on her hands, indicating a struggle. From the state of the body, the investigators also deemed the break-in to be physically motivated. These gruesome details underscore the intense violence perpetrated by the killer providing insight into the heinous nature of the act. The case was taken over by the sheriff of Polk County Sheriff's Office, Grady Judd. Not only did the assailant's truck get washed away, but it became difficult to find out who the murderer was as investigators were hindered by the rain in their efforts to identify the murderer. This made it significantly difficult for them to proceed without solving the case. As time went by, Teresa's family found themselves at a crossroads. Their loved one, gone, and no help from nature in bringing whoever did it behind bars. The investigators faced difficulties in collecting crucial evidence as they tried to unravel the complexities of the case. The investigation into Teresa's murder became a daunting task, with the elements themselves becoming enemies. The initial stages were characterized by continuous rain, which made it difficult for law enforcement to make progress in finding out who committed the murder, adding to the challenges of an already complex case. Betty Scalf remembered, I think she was killed around 3.30 in the afternoon, and by the time I got there at 8 or 9 p.m., all the evidence had been washed away by the rain. At that time, no one was home, and Teresa's son Craig was sleeping over at his grandma's house. All I want to say is it was Come raining. It was raining very hard all day, and it was still misty rain that night. It was just before Halloween, and 
because of the rain, people were not out. Usually the kids would be out playing, but it was raining, they were not out. And of course, by the time, I think she was killed in around 3.30 in the afternoon. And by the time I got there at eight or nine o'clock at night, all the evidence had been wa- washed away by the rain. The crime scene showed gruesome details as Teresa's body had signs of being stabbed aggressively, with her throat almost cut off completely. Investigators searched every inch of the crime scene and found blood splatters inside the house near the body. They collected two different blood samples, one from Teresa and another from an unknown person. It was a crucial piece of evidence. At the time, there were no obvious suspects, despite their efforts, and the lack of DNA genealogy identification or testing made it more difficult to find any leads, ultimately resulting in the case going cold, as there was no way to identify her killer without the right technology. We investigated it through the years, and I want to, you to clearly understand when this occurred in 1986, there was no DNA. There was no DNA genealogy. We knew that we had Teresa's blood, and we had another unknown source of blood, but there was no way to match that. In the year 2000, DNA technology had advanced considerably with the development of the Combined DNA Index System of CODIS, for short, that allowed law enforcement to have access to and update a database containing the DNA profiles from convicted offenders, unsolved crime scene evidence, and missing persons. The blood sample from Teresa's crime scene was entered into the CODIS, but no match was found leaving Teresa Lee Scalf's murder a mystery for years. In 2022, after years of dormancy, the Teresa Lee Scalf cold case came back to life and thus began a new chapter in the quest for justice. The Polk County Sheriff's Office, along with Othram Inc., a forensic genetic genealogy lab, carried out an analysis of preserved blood evidence obtained from the scene. At first, it seemed as though this was an outdated investigation, and there was a possibility of getting justice for the family of Teresa using this modern forensic approach. Forensic genetic genealogy was the game-changer in the Teresa Lee Scalf case. On the other hand, the lab of Othram Inc. used a more advanced technique to analyze this blood sample from 1986 narrowing it down further by linking its DNA to distant relatives of the suspect. It is therefore correct to say that the family associated with the blood sample of the assailant was instrumental in solving the case. In 2022, investigators approached the relatives of the suspects involved, which led them to collecting a DNA sample from Douglas Jr., Donald Douglas's son. Douglas Jr. gave his full cooperation and it was his DNA that finally brought answers. So we took our suspect's blood that we'd run a DNA on and put it in the CODIS database, certain that we would get a hit for someone who would viciously m- murder this beautiful young lady. Nothing at all. And the investigation went on. We suspected a lot of people. We talked to a lot of people. There were th- literally thousands of hours of investigative work that went into this case. This innovative approach brought to light hidden familial connections, which eventually led to the identification of Teresa's killer in a new light. Through DNA testing, it was revealed that the unidentified blood sample from 1986 and the DNA of Douglas Jr. shared a 100% confidence of a parent-child biological relationship. With that, Donald Douglas, then neighbor of Teresa Lee Scalf, the murderer, was finally unveiled. One of our detectives, Matt Newbolt, who is not only assigned to homicide, but cold case homicide, had Teresa Scalf's photograph on his desk 
from early 2015. He said, I'm going to figure out who murdered Teresa. And that's exactly what he did. This is who murdered Teresa, Donald Douglas. This avant-garde ballet of investigative methods brought Donald Douglas to the forefront, marking a watershed moment in law enforcement. The family's journey in this forensic genetic genealogy drama unfolded through cutting-edge technology and unwavering determination that ultimately solved a long-standing mystery. Sheriff Judd acknowledged Detective Matthew Newbold for leading these transformative efforts. Donald Douglas, the elusive murderer of Teresa Lee Scalf, managed to evade the clutches of justice for over three decades. Living just next door to Teresa at the time of the brutal attack, the 33-year-old became a suspect during the initial investigation. However, the case faced significant challenges due to Donald's clean slate, no previous convictions, and the obstacle of his cremation in 2008, which thwarted attempts to collect DNA samples crucial for forensic analysis. While he was officially cleared by law enforcement, his proximity to the crime scene left lingering doubts that shadowed the decades-long pursuit of justice. During the initial investigation, Betty Scalf stated that her daughter had mentioned having a creepy neighbor who exhibited stockish behavior. She also mentioned that Douglas had even approached Teresa's door with a flower, which she found unsettling. His clean record made him impervious to scrutiny, allowing him to move undetected after the cold-blooded murder of Teresa. The investigators were able to piece together the life of Donald Douglas by navigating through a maze of memories and disjointed accounts from decades ago. He managed to avoid suspicion, despite being an unremarkable and reclusive person. The difficulty in catching someone who appeared normal on the outside shows how hard it is to uncover a criminal hiding behind a facade. Investigators suspect that Douglas was driven by romantic rejection to commit the crime. However, an arrest could still not be made. After the revelation of the killer, investigators found that Donald Douglas had passed away in 2008, at the age of 54. He died of natural causes and, as a result, never spent a day in prison, nor had faced the ramifications of taking the life of an innocent person. Her family was shocked to find out that it was Donald Douglas who assaulted Teresa. Consequently, they felt a mixture of relief and deep sadness. The scalps were unable to bear the shocking information of Teresa's murder and its perpetrator being their next-door neighbor. The fact that the family had undergone emotional distress was now obvious. The length of time that passed with no knowledge and unexpected issues during inquiries into the crime had a great effect on them. They had to decide how to feel slightly better due to the closure, but still mourn over Teresa. The narratives surrounding this disturbing case continue to resonate with the shocking exposure of Donald Douglas as Teresa Lee Scalf's murderer. The story seemed simple at first, yet Douglas's involvement in Teresa's murder made it more complex. This is why there was no conviction of charges against him since he died naturally in 2008, and these circumstances create very difficult questions about fairness and accountability for those who have passed away. Fully appreciating the profoundness of Donald's acts required one to understand the intricate emotions of both the Scalf family and the general public. One may ask whether accountability and justice are relevant in solving a cold case that involves a deceased suspect. The turning point came for Teresa's family when her killer was finally unmasked 37 years later. Although this brought with it some answers, it was not enough to heal the old scars of that terrible deed. 
All I want to say is, I'm 84 years old. I live to see this done. I think that's why I live so long. Regardless, the case concluded by focusing on the bittersweetness of closure and knowing that even though the truth is revealed, the loss suffered will remain an open sore and engrave itself in Teresa's heritage and the collective minds of her family. What do you think? Was justice done in the case of Teresa Lee Scalf? How do you think the killer could have been identified earlier and helped reveal the truth? If you like this case, then please leave your comments. We would love to hear from you. And if there's any case you want us to cover, then please feel free to suggest it in the comment section below. For more interesting true crime stories, like, share, and subscribe to our channel. This is one of the most distressing and disturbing murders ever committed in this country. In fact, this horrendous slaughter is notorious around the world, not just for its gruesome brutality, but because it was committed by a rare creature, a female psychopath. To even try to make sense of how Catherine Knight could commit such a terrible act, we need to understand where she came from and where she was always destined to go. This is the story of 44-year-old Catherine Mary Knight, an otherwise unseeming abattoir worker who brutally stabbed her lover, 44-year-old John Prince, 27 times with a butcher's knife on February 29, 2000. This incident stands as an unsettling testament to the extremities of violence and depravity. Born in 1955, Knight's life journey weaves through a turbulent narrative culminating in a shocking act that would etch her name in criminal history. What drives a person to commit such unspeakable acts? What does this case reveal about the shadows that can reside within the human psyche? Tenterfield in New South Wales is a small regional town with a population of just 6,000 people as of 2021. It is a small, conservative community, that has a strong belief system and really takes care of each other. Tenterfield has always had low crime, making it a safe place to live for his residents and those looking to visit. The people are hospitable and friendly and are always welcoming of travelers and visitors. No one could have guessed that one of the most gruesome murderies in the history of Australia would unfold in this quaint, unassuming town. Born on October 24, 1955, in Tenterfield, South Wales, Catherine Knight had an incredibly rough and traumatic childhood. Her mother, Barbara Rogan, was married to Jack Rogan and they lived in a small town of Aberdeen, South Wales. Barbara had four sons from this marriage, and later Barbara started an adulterous relationship with Jack's friend and co-worker, Ken Knight. As it was a small town, such a relationship was considered scandalous, and they received a lot of criticism. This eventually led to Barbara and Ken moving to Maury, South Wales. She left two of her sons with Jack, and two were sent to Sydney to live with their aunt. She went on to have four more kids with Ken, including twin girls, one of which was Knight. When Knight was four, Jack Ruffman died and that forced her stepbrothers who were living with Jack to move in with them. The affair was not really working on this side. Ken was toxic and abusive. He assaulted Barbara at least ten times a day. Barbara, on the other hand, shared these violent details with her kids, which was really traumatic for them. Knight later confessed to being physically exploited by multiple people in her family but not her father. Barbara was very close to her twin sister and her uncle Oscar Knight. However, that bond did not last long and Oscar decided to end his life in 1969, which was a heartbreaking moment for Knight, and that haunted her for years. She often said that she was so devastated that she used to see his ghost visiting her. 
Knight went to Miss Wellbrook High School, where she found it hard to fit in, and was considered a loner by her peers. She often bullied people and smaller children. During an incident, she assaulted a boy with a weapon, and was injured by a teacher who was protecting herself. However, Knight was a well-behaved student when she was not involved in these fights, which clearly shows that she was dealing with a lot of issues and trauma of her own. Knight never got to complete her education and left school at 18. She did not know how to read and write. Catherine moved through a lot of schools. She was very close to her sister Joy, but she didn't have a lot of close friends. Uh, and Catherine was not a confident girl and didn't make friends easily. She had a terrible temper, but she was also very shy. Luckily, though, she found a job as a cutter in a clothing factory, where she worked for a year. Things did take a drastic change when she found a job for cutting up animals, specifically offal and abattoir. Already with a history of violence, this only heightened her issues. She called it her dream job and quickly left her old one. She moved swiftly in her dream job and was very soon promoted to boning and was given butcher's knives. There was something disturbing about the way Catherine loved to work. Other workers talk of her nicking arteries just to watch, watch the carcasses bleed or the animals bleed. She took a sort of malevolent pleasure in death. Catherine's pathological profile means she would also have had many fantasies about killing people. Fortunately for those around her, her bloodlust was partially satisfied at the abattoir. The abattoir was her killing field. Catherine got off on the screaming and the blood of the animals being put to death. She would also have loved the fear she instilled in others who watched her and saw that nothing could faze her. The obsession grew and Knight used to hang them over her bed as she said they, quote, would always be handy if I needed them. A habit that stuck with her. And I said to Kathy, why do you have knives in the bed or hang them on the wall? She said, shrugged her shoulders and with a pout, you know, she was just childlike at time. They're there in case I need them. They were her pride and joy. I think she loved those as her knives as much as she loved David. In 1973, Catherine Knight turned 18 and met a co-worker, David Stenford Kellett. David was an active alcoholic with a lot of past trauma from his previous railway jobs. He saw his best friend being killed in a shunting accident, and later when he was trying to rescue occupants of a school bus struck by a train, but six kids died in that incident as well. All this trauma made him look for substances and eventually was even kicked out of his job for heavy drinking. Soon he also joined the same place as Knight and was working as a butcher. They connected easily, considering they both had gone through quite a bit. They eventually married in 1974. The marriage was bumpy, to say the least. Knight tried to strangle David on their wedding night itself, which she later explained that he slept off after the lovemaking. Later, when she became pregnant, there was another incident. Knight burned off all of David's clothes and hit him across the back all because he arrived late at home, not considering that he was playing a game of darts and reached the final. This was shocking for David, if not entirely surprising, considering the past incidents and her obsessive behavior. But soon, he had enough, and fled, and collapsed at a neighbor's house. He was treated for many fractures. Police arrived at the scene and wanted to charge Knight, but she convinced David that she would change and he dropped the charges. Later, David left her for another woman, soon after Knight gave birth to their newborn Melissa Ann and moved to Queensland. Unable to cope with the loss, she was seen pushing her newborn down the street. She was admitted to St. Elmo Hospital in Tamworth and was diagnosed with postnatal depression and spent weeks recovering there. Even after releasing, she placed her daughter, who was two years old at the time, at the railway tracks, who was rescued by an unsheltered man. Knight was furious at David and slashed a woman's face and even held a boy hostage, telling them to drive her to David. She was arrested and was later left to the care of her mother-in-law and David. 
David instantly moved in with his mother and took care of Catherine after hearing of this incident. They had another daughter, Natasha Marie. Eventually, Knight left David and moved to Aberdeen. John Charles Thomas Prince was born on April 4, 1955. He was called a terrific bloke and was pretty much liked by everyone who knew him. He was previously married, which ended in divorce in 1988. He had three kids from the marriage, and the youngest daughter was just two years old, who lived with his ex-wife, and the other two kids were with him. He was aware of Knight's violent outbursts when he started his affair, but was somehow okay with that. She moved in with him in 1995. John's family liked Knight, and apart from some minor arguments, which are common in couples, they had a good time together. Surprisingly, Knight even got along with his two kids, and they liked her as well. John was also making a lot of money at the local mines, so they had more than enough for a comfortable life. Around 1998, Knight videotaped some items that John stole from work and sent it to his boss. The reason she did this was because John didn't want to marry her. The items weren't useful and were mostly trash and out-of-date medical kits. John was still fired from his reputed job that he had had for 17 years, and that was it for him. He kicked her out of his house. However, the obsession didn't wear off completely, and she restarted the relationship, this time refusing to let her move in with him. Their arguments were more frequent now, which impacted John's life as well. Once jolly and liked by everyone, John became isolated, and even his friends slowly started parting ways because of Knight's behaviors and actions. In February of 2000, John Prince had already gone through multiple assaults by Knight. And this was the final blow, when Catherine Knight stabbed him in the chest that same month. He kicked her out of the house again and went to Scone's Magistrate Court on February 28th to get a restraining order to protect his family. In a desperate attempt to fortify the frail defenses around his family, John confided in his co-workers, leaving them with a chilling prophecy, quote, if I don't appear tomorrow, she's taken my life. It was a haunting echo of his own mortality, a stark admission that the relentless terror inflicted by night could culminate in the ultimate price. Later, he went home and sent his kids to a sleepover. He stayed with the neighbors till 11 p.m. before returning home. Earlier that day, Knight had bought black lingerie and videotaped Oliver Kidd while making comments which have since been interpreted as a crude will. She arrived at John's house that night, and they indulged in lovemaking. The next day, a neighbor became concerned that John's car was still at home, and later his employer sent a co-worker to check on him as well. Both of them found blood on his front door and immediately alerted the police. The police arrived and broke down the back door and found John's body. Knight stabbed him with her butcher's knife at least 37 times while he was sleeping. Several hours after John Price's tragic demise, Catherine Knight committed unspeakable acts, turning the crime scene into a house of horror. She callously skinned John and hung his skin from a meat hook on the lounge room door. The ruthlessness continued as she decapitated him and proceeded to cook parts of his body. The macabre scene included a bizarre setting at the dinner table. The cooked flesh served with baked potato, carrot, pumpkin, beetroot, zucchini, cabbage, yellow squash, and gravy. Shockingly, notes beside each plate bore the names of John's children, indicating Knight's twisted plan to serve their father's remains to them. A third meal, inexplicably thrown on the back lawn, remains shrouded in mystery, prompting speculation that Knight may have attempted to consume it herself, but could not proceed. This detail aligns with her claims of amnesia regarding the crime. John's head was discovered in a pot with vegetables, still warm, suggesting the gruesome cooking occurred in the early morning. There was a note beside each plate, 
with writing on it, with um, the names uh, John and Beck. They showed the video of the crime scene in court, and it's perhaps the most horrific video you would ever wish to see. It's just unimaginable what the police saw that day and what was recorded on that video. The skin looked like a wetsuit. It took you a while to work out what it was. It was hanging on a butcher's hook in the doorway. It had all come off in one piece. Probably the worst bit of the video was when they went to the stove in the kitchen and you see the gloved hand of a forensic policeman take the lid off the pot on the top of the stove and inside it's uh, Price's head staring back up at the camera. That to me is Cathy showing her ultimate power. To further exhibit her contempt, Knight arranged the body with the left arm draped over an empty 1.25 liter soft drink bottle, legs crossed, a haunting act of defilement. The horror culminated with a blood-stained handwritten note left atop a photograph of John. Catherine Knight was arrested and brought to court in March 2001. It came over the radio that a lady from Aberdeen had killed her husband and I just looked at my husband and I said, you know, that, that would have to be my sister-in-law. It couldn't be anybody else. It would have to be Kathy. And my husband said, you know, Sandy, you've said a lot of things about her over the years, but I don't think she's that crazy. And then it came over the news only hours later that it was Kathy. And it was no surprise to me. It was no surprise to any of our family. On March 2nd, she pleaded guilty to manslaughter, which was rejected. She was then charged with murdering John Prince, to which she pleaded not guilty. Her trial was fixed for the 23rd of July 2001, but was adjourned because her lawyer was ill and was decided later on the 15th of October. This was an excruciating and intense trial. The judge, Justice Barry O'Keefe, offered the jury options of being excused due to the amount of harsh photographic evidence that were present and five out of 60 accepted it. Later, when the witness list was read out to prospects, more dropped out, leading to the jury being impaneled. The next morning, Knight changed her plea to guilty, and the jury was dismissed. The judge adjourned the trial and then ordered a psychiatric evaluation for her. This was in order to understand that she was in the right mind to gauge the guilty plea. Knight's legal team had planned to secure her by claims of disassociation and amnesia, which a lot of psychologists supported. Amanda, you recall Price you being in the bed? I can't remember anything. Do you recall yourself going to bed? Faintly. Although she claims to have no memory of the night of Pricey's death, she did remember stabbing him six months earlier. Once Pricey got off the phone, he started on me and I was around washing up and I could have been a fork, a spoon or anything in my hand. It was a knife that cut your meal with and I aimed it at him and it got him. He was leaning closer than what I thought and my eyesight was bad at that time. I've only had new glasses since then. However, the evaluation concluded that she suffered from borderline personality disorder. There has been no reason or explanation given to this day about the guilty plea, and Knight avoided any responsibility for her actions as well. She was charged with John's murder and became the first Australian woman who was sentenced to life without parole. She is held at Silver Waters Correctional Facility in Sydney and will remain there all of her life. I don't know, for some reason, I just can't seem to hate her. I can't feel the hate. But a lot of my friends have always said to me that's a good thing, that that's a lot of my dad inside me because dad was, how dad was, he was, he didn't hate anybody. And he used to say to me, babe, just be happy. Just be happy, just be happy. I can remember asking her sister Joy um, had she been to see Catherine and I think at that point in time she'd been twice but Catherine had said to her that she didn't want visitors 
and that um, she was happy where she was because she felt safe now. Catherine Knight's descent into infamy serves as a haunting testament to the profound impact of unchecked violence on individuals, families, and communities. The wounds inflicted by her actions extend far beyond the walls of the courtroom, leaving an indelible mark on the lives of John Prince's family and the collective consciousness of a nation. The stark question persists, can justice ever truly be served in the face of such heinous acts? Do you think this could have been prevented, as there were clear signs of violence and unresolved issues with Catherine Knight? Why do you think John Prince allowed her in the house even after he got a restraining order and told his colleagues she might kill him? Is this love or obsession that ends in chaos and losing one's life? As we close this chapter on Catherine Knight's horrifying legacy, we are compelled to reflect on the broader implications for a society tasked with preventing the recurrence of such atrocities. Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. And please remember to like, share, and subscribe to the channel for more like this. If you have suggestions for cases you'd like us to cover, let us know those as well. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. So could it be possible that Catherine Knight was sane when she committed this murder? How could someone in their right mind do something so completely deranged? Well, the fact is that Catherine was not insane when she butchered John Price. She planned what she was doing, she knew right from wrong, and there were no voices telling her to kill him. She was coldly lucid throughout the murder and dismemberment. And not only was she in her right mind, she was having one of the best times of her life. So if she's not mad, is Catherine just bad? Is she some kind of evil monster, completely alien to the rest of us? Catherine Knight's personality is best summed up in one word, psychopath. She's ruthless, self-serving, incapable of feeling guilt, and dangerous until the day she dies. A 44-year-old cold case murder finally solved. Today, the Charles County Sheriff's Office announced an arrest in the death of Vicki Lynn Belk. She was only 28 years old when deputies say she was kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and killed. On the summer evening of August 29, 1979, tragedy struck when a 28-year-old federal worker and young mother, Vicki Lynn Belk's life, was suddenly cut short. Her lifeless body was discovered in a wooded area off Metropolitan Church Road near Route 227 in Bryans Road, Southern Maryland. Despite the prompt initial investigation, law enforcement agencies faced a daunting challenge with no potential leads. There were no means to analyze DNA samples at the time, but crucial evidence was collected. Despite this, the case went on for an agonizing 44 years, until the evidence collected at the time was reevaluated in early 2022. A breakthrough and a significant turn in the case occurred, and a profile was developed and entered into the Combined DNA Index System, or CODIS. As we dig deeper, more and more questions surface. What was the motive for targeting Vicki Lynn Belk? Who was the killer? And what was the evidence that brought down the hammer of justice? Let us dive right in and look at what happened on that fateful evening of August 29th, 1979. This case takes us to Suitland, an unincorporated community in Prince George's County, Maryland, USA, that offers its residents a blend of urban and suburban living. With a population of 26,375 as of 2023, the serene atmosphere of this suburb makes it an ideal place for families to thrive. Weekends are enjoyed by liberal-minded residents who frequent the renowned parks that add to the community's beauty. Despite its charm, crime rates in Suitland are notably higher than the national average across communities of all sizes in America. 
against this backdrop. The story of Vicki Lynn Belk sheds light on the darker side of this community. Vicki Lynn Belk was born on March 20, 1951, to parents Lonnie and Maydell Belk. She was the eldest child among six siblings. Hailing from Alexandria, Virginia, the Belk family was known for their resilience and commitment to civil rights. Lonnie and Maydell, whose age is unavailable, Vicky's parents, played a pivotal role in the desegregation movement against a school back in 1959. They successfully won a lawsuit against the Board of Education, allowing Vicky and her sister Judy to become the first African-American students at Minnie Howard Elementary School in Alexandria. Both sisters later graduated from T.C. Williams High School in 1969. Vicky was a child of the Civil Rights era and inherited the family's strong principles. Despite facing adversity and violence, the Belk family remained unwavering in their commitment to family and community rights. Vicky, in particular, was actively involved in voicing her opinions and protecting her community. Vicky was also a great leader, and her leadership qualities were evident to her siblings, who looked up to her thoughtful and giving nature. In a time when opportunities were scarce, she became the first in her family to graduate from college. In 1974, she earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Education from St. Augustine College in Raleigh, North Carolina. Her dedication extended to her professional life landing her a position as a management analyst in the Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Despite the demands of her job, Vicki also found time to be a loving mother to her son Lamont Belk, who was just seven at the time, and remained fully devoted to him. She also served as a Sunday school teacher and church clerk at Oakland Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia, co-founded by her great-grandfather Wesley Casey. In early August 1979, the family gathered at Oakland Baptist Church to celebrate the wedding of Vicky's little sister Judy. Vicky attended the wedding with her then boyfriend James Hill, who she had met at work. Not only did she support Judy as the maid of honor, but also actively contributed to organizing much of the event. Following Judy's wedding, Vicky resumed her normal life with her boyfriend. Both were employees of the Department of Agriculture and, despite their job's demands, continued their relationship and shared a romantic connection. The festivities of Judy's wedding marked a moment of joy for the Belk family before the tragic event that was about to unfold in the days that followed. On August 27, 1979, Vicki and James began their day following their usual routine. They got ready and rode from their apartment to Stadium Armory Station. From there, they took a train to their respective offices. Vicky had errands to run that day and planned to do them after lunch. She informed James that she would meet him at the parking lot in the evening after work. After completing his workday, James arrived at the parking lot, but he didn't find Vicky or the car. Growing increasingly worried, he waited until sundown but there was no sign of her. Concerned, James called her friends and family to inquire about Vicky's whereabouts, but no one had any information. That night he went home, waiting anxiously for Vicky, who never returned. On the morning of August 28, 1979, James reported Vicky missing to the Prince George's County Police Department. However, he was told that, as an adult, an official report could only be filed after 72 hours. With no other options, James had to wait. He eventually shared the distressing news with Vicky's family. It was unusual for Vicky not to inform her loved ones about her whereabouts, especially considering her responsibilities as a mother. Waiting for the 72 hours to pass was excruciating for the family and they were starting to sense that something was seriously wrong. The turning point came on the evening of Wednesday, August 29th, at 7 p.m., when a local teenage boy riding his bike near Route 227 in Maryland 
discovered a dead body in the woods, 20 feet off the road, along Metropolitan Church Road and Livingston Road. Recognizing the severity of the situation, he promptly informed his mother, who then contacted the authorities straight away. Upon promptly arriving at the crime scene, officers discovered the lifeless body of a partially clothed woman with a gunshot wound to her head. The deceased was swiftly transported to the chief medical examiner in Baltimore, where on August 30, 1979, she was identified as Vicki Lynn Belk. The tragic incident was classified as a homicide. The Charles County Sheriff's Office contacted Vicki's parents, Maydell and Lonnie, urgently relaying information about Vicki and urging them to come to the police department. During the journey to the station, Lonnie and Maydell clung to a glimmer of hope, hoping against hope that Vicki might be injured but alive. However, their optimism shattered upon arrival as they were met with the devastating news that their eldest daughter had been assaulted, murdered, and left on the roadside. Maydell, overwhelmed with grief, couldn't contain her pain and broke down, expressing her sorrow and vehemently condemning the perpetrator behind her daughter's tragic fate. He just threw Vicky in the woods like a dog. They couldn't believe that their innocent daughter faced such atrocities and was inhumanely dealt with. They were in a state of shock and trauma. However, despite their profound grief, they placed their trust in the detectives, especially Detective Sergeant John Elliott and Forensic Deputy Director Noel German, yearning for justice. Police recovered Vicky's belongings, including brown shoes, hair samples, nail clippings, jewelry, bra, dress, and slip. Unfortunately, these items did not yield substantial leads during testing, due to lacking technological advancements in DNA testing. With no witnesses or any other evidence to shed light upon the case, the trail of Vicky's killer ultimately went cold. The detectives diligently conducted interviews with Vicky's family, colleagues, and individuals in the vicinity of the crime scene. Despite their relentless efforts and thorough pursuit of leads, the investigation encountered obstacles and progress was slow. A significant focus was placed on locating James's car, which Vicky had used on the day she went missing, with the hope that it might hold clues to her assailant. After days of searching, James's Buick was located, abandoned in Washington, D.C. Regrettably, there was no trace of the killer. Undeterred by the lack of immediate breakthroughs, the Detective Sergeant John Elliott and Detective Director Noel German remained resolute in their commitment to finding Vicky's murderer. They carefully preserved all gathered evidence, which included the shoes, her dress and nail clippings, anticipating that this could potentially unlock new avenues for testing and analysis. The investigation persisted over the years, fueled by the unwavering hope that justice would eventually prevail for Vicky. In the years that followed, as technology advanced, detectives from Charles County collaborated with Maryland State Police utilizing cutting-edge tools at a technology facility in Lorton, Virginia. Bode Technology Group, and Sorensen's Laboratories in Salt Lake City, Utah. Their mission was to reevaluate the evidence in Vicky's case, aiming to uncover her killer and bring them to justice. The investigation encountered persistent disappointment, but it never stopped. It wasn't until the 1980s that DNA testing technology progressed exponentially. Authorities began building an extensive database comprising DNA samples and fingerprints collected from individuals charged with crimes nationwide. By the early 2000s, with further advancements in DNA technology, detectives revisited Vicky's case. During this re-examination, a potential breakthrough emerged as foreign bodily fluid was discovered on Vicky's dress. However, the testing technology still required significant improvement preventing the developed suspect profile from being entered into any database or compared to known suspects. Despite the passage of decades, 
the determined detectives persisted in their efforts. Systematically retesting Vicky's belongings found at the crime scene with each technological advancement. Their hope was to finally unravel the enduring mystery that had haunted them for almost four decades. Over the years, detectives continued their search in tandem with developments of the CODIS. The outcome of this continued testing allowed them to establish a DNA profile of a male whose bodily fluids were present on Vicky's dress on November 1, 2022. This development brought a glimmer of hope to law enforcement, raising the possibility that Vicky's murderer could finally be identified and brought to justice. The recently created DNA profile underwent comparison with entries in CODIS, or the Combined DNA Index System. If you're not aware of CODIS, it's like a big DNA database run by the FBI. It helps state and local crime labs keep and check DNA information from different crime scenes. Following an examination of multiple profiles, the forensic department discovered a match in their system. The identified profile belonged to Andre Taylor, a 63-year-old man from Washington, D.C., not much is known about Andre's parents or what he did in his early life. During the investigation, it was revealed that around the time of Vicky's murder, Andre lived in his aunt's residence in Charles County, situated less than four miles from the location where Vicky's body was discovered. Detectives managed to find Taylor's DNA in the national database as he was arrested for several violent crimes which occurred in Washington, D.C., he was a few months shy of his 19th birthday when he committed this heinous crime. However, suspicion was not enough to make an arrest. The detectives required more substantial evidence to connect him to the dreadful crime. Finding Andre proved to be a problem, as he was consistently changing his whereabouts since 2019. Finally, in March of 2023, the detectives located him in a nursing home in Washington, D.C. Armed with a search warrant acquired through the aid of the United States Homeland Security Investigation's D.C. Metropolitan Police Department and the U.S. Secret Service Baltimore Field Office, Taylor was confronted and a swab of his saliva was obtained for a direct comparison with the DNA from the crime scene. After taking the saliva, the detectives left for a direct comparison of the DNA found on the dress with Vicky. They were unworried about his potential escape due to his current health condition. With one amputated leg, Andre faced physical limitations and his health was visibly deteriorating. On June 16, 2023, laboratory tests once again verified a DNA match with Andre's profile. The Charles County State's Attorney's Office presented the facts of the DNA match to a Charles County grand jury. He received formal charges of first-degree murder and first- and second-degree physical assault. Subsequently, on June 22, 2023, he was arrested and ordered to be held without bond. On June 27, Taylor was taken into Charles County Detention Center, where he was charged. Once Andre was arrested and put to jail, the Sheriff of Charles County, Troy D. Berry, joined by Vicky's family, held a press conference. The room was charged with emotion, as Vicky's family, visibly moved to tears, found themselves reliving the painful past. Lamont Belk, Vicky's son, now 51, expressed gratitude towards law enforcement. I have the honor and privilege of speaking on behalf of our family and really coming forward with much and tremendous gratitude to Sheriff Barry and to the Honorable Tony Covington, the state's attorney for this county, for leading the investigation and now prosecution of this case. And thank God for touching their hearts and minds and all of those at whom they supervise for making this day possible. Judy Belk, Vicki's sister, warmly reminisced about her departed sibling, sharing a cherished memory. Ricky Belk, Vicky's brother, also reflected on the profound impact the tragic incident had on their mother. Vicky's son achieved significant milestones, 
graduating from Morehouse College and George Mason University Law School in 2009. He pursued a career as the assistant district attorney of Tulp County, Georgia. Kay, Vicki's sister, retired as a sergeant from the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Office in California. Lonnie, also known as Ricky Belk, brother of Vicki, serves as a lieutenant in the Fairfax County Fire and Rescue Department. In the aftermath of Vicki's tragic murder, the Belk family established the Vicki Belk Scholarship Foundation in 1980 to honor her memory and provide scholarships. Operating under the role of the scholarship board, the foundation aims to raise funds for graduating seniors at Oakland Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia, where Vicki was baptized. Their objective is to offer opportunities to carry forward the legacy of Vicki Lynn Belk. Despite the case lasting for years, it is still a mystery why Andre took Vicky's life. Vicky's opportunity for a good life was inhumanely taken away, deeply affecting those who held her dear. However, with her killer now behind bars, a sense of closure and relief has settled within the family. Now, let's hear what you make of this case. In light of the challenges faced during the investigation, and the emotional toll on families, how can the criminal justice system be improved further to provide more timely and compassionate support for the victim's families? And what community-based initiatives can be implemented to support families enduring the prolonged uncertainty of unsolved cases and ensure they receive the assistance they need? If there's a case you'd like us to cover, then drop your recommendations in the comment section below. For more captivating true crime stories, like, share, and subscribe to our channel.